Hello there, my name is Bruce Rain from Brankus Creations and thank you very much for joining. Uh, let's just have a quick look and see who we've got here. We've got Jay, welcome. We have Jeff Bernard, Barnard, we have Michael Mullet, we have Trina Conrad. Alex is here, Aaron is here, John is here, uh, Dana is here. Um, who else? Oz Retrocomp. Uh, thank you to you all for joining. Thank you very much and wow, isn't my screen a little bit bright. I'm a little bit bright today. Sorry, let me just uh, uh, unbrighten myself here a little bit. Um, I feel uh, very, very bright. There we go. That's a little bit better. Marginally better. It's a lovely so sunshiny day here in Sydney. Um, let's just quick and quickly have a look here and see if... Uh, yeah, okay, no worries. And, uh, we need something that goes great stickers of yours, <laughs> Dana. Yeah, they, they are fantastic. Um, <clears throat> international roast and a packet of iced bovos. Awesome. Um, okay, so anyone out there who's not sure what an iced bovo is, I've had a, I have actually shown them on one of my live streams before, but it is a an Australian biscuit or what Americans would call a cookie. Um, um, okay, so. Um, I am, as mentioned in the uh, in the description, I'm going to be recapping a Macintosh 2CI today, which was uh, brought to me by one of my regular customers. Uh, if you can see, it's actually this one. Let me get this out of the way. Out of the way, you. We're also going to be answering the question of just how dirty can this workshop get before I decide to clean it. Here we go. Here's a leftover piece of the Apple Lisa I was working on the other day. I had to replace the uh, mouse connector. Um, so that's the old one. Um, so, um, so this one was previ previously owned by Optus, um, and uh, for those in Australia, they'll know who that is, but that's our uh, uh, second biggest telco in this country. Uh, this is their old logo, um, and uh, yeah, so this was obviously used by them at some stage, probably in their design department, I would think, because I don't think they use them in their, uh, uh, in their main department. I've got so many old capacitors lying around. See, I, I just, I, when I take them off, I just scatter them. Um, okay, so this is, okay, watching Doctor Who, John Pertwee on your recap. Okay, which episode is it, uh, Michael? Which episode of uh, John Pertwee, uh, Doctor Who are you watching? I'd be very interested to know. Um, so, um, this is probably one of the dirtiest 2CIs I've ever seen, but this is one that's just come straight out of storage. Uh, it's very dusty. Um, the owner has basically said that it worked when put away into storage. It was put away without a battery, so we've got no problems with battery explosion. Um, and however, I am not going to fire it up before recapping. I mean, I've said this before. I just it risks too much with something like this being sitting in uh, in a shed for too long. Better to just recap it. Um, crazy tech reviews. Hello. Um, start taking bets on how long it will be before you clean your shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, f I really feel compelled to do it this weekend, so that, that may not last very long, because I just, I'm getting kind of sick of it. But anyhow, um, uh, Nick Y, uh, a show called Unsolved Mysteries from 1993, and my video at the same time. Ooh, don't get those mixed up. Um, okay, so, um, workbench looks tiny to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I know anyone who, with a workshop knows. I mean, all you need is a space to work, isn't it? You know, it's at the end of the day, you just keep pushing things out of the way. Um, and, um, okay, Terror of the Autons. That's the, uh, if I, I could be wrong, but I think Terror of the Autons was the very first Pertwee episode. It was in colour, I think. Uh, they then reverted back to a little few black and white episodes before they then reverted to colour for good. If I if I am correct, I'm pretty sure Terror of the Autons was the first colour Doctor Who. So, um, all right. So, uh, lid. Let's put this somewhere. Somewhere. I'm not running out of space in here uh, for things like lids. <coughs> um, okay. So. Um, Right, yes, okay, so I'm going to pull this uh, 2CI apart, pretty straightforward with these. There's normally a screw down here, normally a screw down there. There is no screw in this one, so I do not need to undo it. But I do need to remove the power supply, and that is done with a little bit of a push and a wiggle. It's, it's, there's a little clip underneath this uh, uh, drive assembly thing here, which you just need to pull with your pinky finger, and then you just wiggle this little guy out. Come on, come 
Well, he's moving, he's moving. Because the uh, owner did actually supply this to me with all these bits already removed, but I thought, no, 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 I'll put them all back in for storage until I get onto it. Oh, consign it. Come out. This thing is still... There we go. There we go. Now it's unclipped. Okay, this is an Aztec power supply. Um, there we go. And then the uh, drive assembly comes out. There's, there's nothing plugged in. I didn't even get a SCSI cable with this. So just undo this little clippy thing at the side here and lift it out. Out, out. Thank you. And that's it there. And there would normally be a hard drive here, but there is no hard drive or a little tray thing. I do have a spare one if the guy's lost it, but I don't think he has. Uh, and the floppy drive is in a little plastic condom uh, to keep the dust out, when in actual fact all it does is keep the dust in, as you can see here. Um, so that's the drive assembly. Let's put that out of the way. And uh, he's also given me a SCSI 2SD that he would like me to uh, pop uh, a, a little card in and format and get it all ready. For anyone who hasn't seen one of these before, I must photograph this for one of my next videos. This is a SCSI 2SD version 3. Let's get, let's get a zoom in. Zoom. There we go. SCSI 2SD version 3, really early. Now, if I remember rightly, I think these were all... Uh, all the information with this is all sort of public. You could actually go in and build your own and stuff like that. I would love to get hold of a stack of these boards and bits and stuff and put these together myself. I mean, they're so basic. Look at them. There's only, there's only a handful of components on these things. There's hardly anything there. And then you can just basically put the firmware inside there and away you go. So uh, they've obviously got better since then. But, you know, um, if, if I could get these for dirt cheap, it would be awesome. But anyhow, uh, that's that's that. You can actually tell from the soldering on this chip here that it's a little bit, a little bit, uh, I don't know, sort of uh, DIY, let's say. So I don't want to cause any offence to anyone who may have actually been responsible for building this thing. Okay. Andrew Henderson, hello. Uh, okay. Da -da -da -da. Bought a 2CI today, but it seems like it has the same problem as my 2SI. No sound and no video. Yeah, now, very important thing to remember about the video. The video out of these things is different to the video out of later Macs. So you need the right sort of DV15 adapter thingy uh, in order to get the video signal out of them. Um, so that catches people out a fair bit. Uh, if you buy one of those little adapters that only has eight switches on it, uh, it won't, they, they can't be configured to get the signal out from these guys. It's something to do with sync on green or not syncing on green or something like that. And uh, you, so you need one of the adapters that either has two rows of switches or the one that I think that has 10 switches rather than just eight. That one will actually allow you to configure these for the right signal to, to come out of the 2CI. I've got an adapter that I use. Did I bring it down with me? If I'm smart, I did. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Awesome, great to know I'm smart. Um, so this is the adapter here um, that I use and behind this little panel is two rows of switches. And this is the one that I can use for the 2CI and, uh, and other Macs of that vintage that use that slightly different output signal. 2SI does the same thing. Well, if you've got a 2SI, then you'd know that. So I'm probably just wasting my breath. But anyhow, just letting people know anyway. Um, so, so just very quickly, with the 2CI that you bought, Nick, um, you got no sound, but when you press the button, the, the light comes on, I take it. Uh, the light comes on on the board, so it, you know, it is actually powering on. I'm just checking that. Uh, right, okay, where are we? Um, uh, okay, just having a look, having a look, having a look. Uh, uh, a factory anti-static bag or an aftermarket modification is that the, as in the um, the thing around the floppy drive? Yeah, it's it's it, the well, the thing around the floppy drive is definitely um, from the factory. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, 
uh, those switch combinations are a total pain to get right. Yeah, uh, the thing is I have a few of those adapters and I just keep this one on 2CI, 2SI, LC. I keep that on that setting all the time. For any of the later computers, I use another one. So this is this this is just like my 2CI one. Boom, boom. Um, right, okay, so yeah, the light turns on. Okay, that's that's what I would expect. Um, okay, all right, so anyhow, obviously it needs, you know, recapping, I would say. The one good thing is if the light turns on, you know the startup circuit works, and that's one of the problems that often happens with these two CIs. So uh, if, you're, if you're part of the way there, if you're getting a power light, um, you know, you know you're not, you haven't got a damaged startup circuit, so that's a really good thing. Now, let's uh, get my little Ziploc bag from here. I think I might have an empty. Yes, I've got an empty here. Oh, no, I've burned through that one with a soldering iron. So I won't use that one. This one's okay. Got an old number on it, but that's okay. I can scribble it out and write a new one on. This one is job. Incidentally, I've been using a new job ticketing system that I wrote, which I'm quite happy with. It goes quite well. There are a few things that I want to change. Uh, and I haven't been using it for very long, and I'm already up to job number 35, so people are sending me quite a lot of work at the moment. Right, so, which is fine. I'm not complaining. Keeps my weekends busy, that's for sure. Okay, here's our lovely little uh, uh, hard drive power cable, which comes straight off the board. Go from a little square to your little square plug to the normal sort of uh, Molex hard drive connector. Uh... Right, uh, right, okay. I've got to pull out all this. Um, actually, let's just take the board out first. So I need to get the um, speaker out, and that's a little lovely, beautifully built these. Love it. I don't know if this is going to fit in this Ziploc bag. This is a 32 ohm, 0 0.5 watt speaker. Anyone who's worked with a few Macs knows that some of the speaker sort of impedances of the speakers on Max are pretty wacky and out there. And finding replacements, I mean, trying to find a replacement like that these days, I mean, pfft, good luck. You probably just have to build something and, you know, buy it as close as you can and try and get it to fit in there somehow. Rather, you probably have to damage the plastic and stuff. Terrible, terrible. Um, now, there is, as I mentioned before, there, there, there's normally a screw that goes through there which holds the... the drive assembly on that's not there um, but I um, can uh, you know sort of without that screw this basically just slides forward it just slides like that and then it just comes out so I said and then it just comes out don't make a liar of me thing you it hasn't come forward quite enough yet there we go that's that's the magic magic millimeter I needed okay Here's our empty and dusty case. I might give that a little bit of a blow with some uh, uh, some compressed air later on. I have a little air compressor down here in my workshop because I need to blow dust off things all the time. Um, let's get all these. These look like probably one megabyte. Yeah, these are one megabyte. They might be bigger, but they're, I think they're probably one megabyte sims with uh, two chips on them. Um, which means that this probably had, yep, oh, actually, look, it's, it's there. One M. Yeah, on there already, nice and easy. Um, yo. Okay, on the inside of the case. Don't soak wash them in any solution of uh, hypochlorite leach. I never would. Uh, yeah, I, that's good to know. That's very good to know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I am someone who, when I clean... If I am cleaning a, um, uh, a computer, I mean, I would generally just sort of blow the dust out of the inside and I would just, um, uh, I would just sort of uh, clean the outside like with a, with a you know, fairly gentle surface cleaner. Um, I, 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 for anyone out in Australia, I, use, I assume this is an Australian only product. I use a product called Nifty. Uh, which I find is quite good, gets a lot of grime off, but doesn't do any damage to the plastic. And when it comes to doing things like bleaching and you know uh, retro brining and all that sort of stuff, I I, I just don't care. Um, that I think is also one megabyte. Uh, yeah, I, I really really don't care about the yellowing of plastic. I want it to be clean, but I don't care if it's yellow, so I don't I don't do any sort of retro brining. I just embrace the yellow. Um, 
I don't have any objection to someone who wants to go through the retro brining process. That's entirely up to them. Uh, but yeah, not for me. Okay, so here is the beautiful board. And as you can see, we've got quite a few little surface mount electrolytic capacitors floating around. And we also have a few of these axial electrolytic as well. Generally, these ones don't have any major problems. They're just sort of um, sort of filters for the power supply, I think. Um, and uh, But I replace them anyway because, you know, do a thorough job. Oh, and I might just take this power button off because they have a tendency to get lost. I think I do have a couple of spares floating around. But keep them all in the little ziplock. Probably would have been better with a slightly larger bag for this, wouldn't I? Yellow, yellowing equals patina. I am I'm with you there. Um, uh, da, 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 da. If you want to beta test of your ticketing system, let me know. Um, thank you very much, Trina. I, I may well take you up on that. I've, I've also got uh, Jay, uh, Jay Vry from the uh, um, uh, the uh, Macchiat group who is well, he said hello at the beginning of the video, but he hasn't said anything then. So you know what he's done. He's he's come on, he's said hello, and then he's nicked off again. Um, he's off playing darts or something, or labelling things. I think he's labelling things at the moment. But anyhow, Jay, um, who uh, is also doing service, he's looking for very specific things. And he was telling me some of the things he wanted on his ticketing system. And I thought, ooh, they sound awesome. I'm going to add that. So I'm going to be adding something to my system that it gives a customer page so that when they send me a job to do, I can email them a link to say, your, your job has been logged into the ticketing system, click here to see the status. And they'll be able to click on it and view anything that I have done and what status the job is in. Whether it's you know just been logged, it hasn't been logged at yet, whether it's in progress, if it's in progress, what work have I done, that sort of thing. So I looked at that and I thought, you know, he was saying he wanted to be able to do that. I thought that is just awesome. So I'm gonna add that. But at the moment it doesn't do that much. It just allows me to, set up prices on procedures and assign procedures to jobs that I do and then keep notes. And of course I have to, one of the things I have to do with this, I have to record very clearly and accurately the condition that things were in when they arrived. Because, you know, if a computer is missing a foot or, you know, like one of the rubber feet, or if it's, I don't know, missing a screw or something like that, I've got to make, um, you know, a, a record of that. So that when I go to give it back, I give it back in the same state that it arrived. So. Uh, okay, so, and see some yellow stuff on the board. I hope the battery leak's not that bad. Yeah, Shella says there's no battery leakage. Yeah, well, yeah, you got to be careful <laughs> what people say. Um, all right, okay, well, let's, um, let's have a look at this under the microscope and just see how bad it is. And obviously from here, you can see it's fairly dirty and you can kind of see it's, it's a little bit matte here rather than glossy. So where the board is kind of glossy up here, um, when we get down to, how, can I, can I get the shining down? Oh God, I'm just, I'm doing this in reverse. If it was a mirror, it'd be easy, but because I am, uh, I'm, I'm looking, there we go. Okay. There you can see, you can see where the shining, you see how glossy it is there, but around those caps, it's, it's actually matte. It's got a matte finish and that's all of that leakage on there. So dry. Um, let me just jump across here and I'm going to have a look quick look here at the analytics. I've got 23 people watching at the moment. So hello to those 23 people. If there's anyone here who's just sort of watching silently, please do jump on and say hello. Always like to hear from folks. Um, all right, so we're gonna jump across now and have a look at the microscope and just see how good or bad this looks. I'm probably gonna to have to do a little bit of adjustment here. I haven't, uh, yes, okay, so let's get that focused. Focus. So it's a bit smeary. I'm going to have to clean my uh, clean my microscope again. They do get grubby, unfortunately. Okay, so let's just have a look now. The region that we're looking at, oh, God, these boards are big. Get away, you thing, you. Oh, make space for these. Not as bad as a two X or a nine, you know, quadrant nine fifty or anything. That's still bad. All right, so. This is, I'm just going to, what we'll do is we'll do a little journey across the board here. Here's the power switch. That's the power switch there. It's nice, it's got a label and everything. Power switch. And then we've got some caps behind it. And then we travel down here and we've got some caps. And here are all the workings of the startup circuit. And this is where things often end up having problems. My own 2CI had this issue. It had all sorts of problems around 
here around this region. So um, it's really important all around there. This is all part of the startup circuit here. So these caps leak on the startup circuit, damage traces, and then you can't get the computer to switch on. Uh, even though the power supply might be fine, it just won't switch on at all. So that's uh, one of the nasty areas. Then, of course, the other one here, which people have been mentioning over here, we have got two nice little sound chips. And as you can see, they are covered in gunk from these caps around here. So that's why you lose sound on these things. Um, and that, that's because of the, uh, the electrolyte on these sound chips and potentially damaged traces. Now I'm just going to make a clean spot here. And even though we've got all this gunge on here, or is this gunge? I think this is gunge. Even we've got this gunge on here, it's on the borderline actually of gunge or scunge. Um, uh, this trace is, is not actually looking too bad underneath all that. Probably left with enough time they would have started to rot underneath, but it hasn't rotted yet. So I suspect this will just be a recap. There probably won't be much in the way of trace repairs that need to be done. So it's not looking too bad. And just for anyone playing along at home, these sound chips, there are two of them on here. They're the same sound chips that you'll find on a... I think classic, but there's only one of them on there because it's uh, obviously a mono. Thing. A classic only has a single audio, this one's stereo. So two sound chips, obviously one for left and one for right. Uh, I use the same sound chips on the Macintosh Portable too, actually. Um, and they are interchangeable, so if you have problems with those sound chips and you need to, need to replace them, I'm pretty sure the classic, let me just uh, check if you've got a 2CI and your sound chips are gone for some reason. Um, okay, different sound chip on the classic too. But the original classic, which I have one here, um, um, yes, same sound chip on the classic. So just so that you know, I mean, obviously you need two of them on this and there's only one on a classic. If you're ever in a situation where you need a sound chip uh, and you've got, you found an old dead classic board, um, you can uh, use the sound chip of it. So yeah, yes, this is definitely caked, caked. Um, right, so, um, let's just check and make sure I haven't missed anything. I am, I'm freezing. I'm going to turn my little heater on here. I've still got gas in it. My legs are cold. Ow! 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 <laughs> I just used one of those. Whee! There we go. I have a little gas heater down here. Just runs off those little cans. Let's sit here. Whee! Little butane gas cans, and I just put it down here. Keep my legs warm. Okay. Um. So uh, I just got to go back and check here. Uh, the plastic becomes way more brittle after brightening. Yes. One good thing about the two CI is it's a model made before the really bad brittle plastic that came out with some of the later ones, like in the later all-in-one LC series. Um, oh, I can just smell gas now. I think it's gone out. Yeah, that's just gas coming out. Let's try it again, shall we? Now, come on. Be good. Keep my legs warm. Stop it. Stop it. It's not going very well at the moment, is it? It's like really pathetic. I think there must be a blockage or something. Oh dear. Yep, it's definitely something blocking it. All right, I'm just going to be cold. I'll just have to suffer. I'm just going to have to suffer here in the cold. Um, okay. Right, just checking. Right. <laughs> oh, Jay, welcome. Uh, we have some fireworks to watch. I can't stick around. Just popped in to say hi. Oh, yes. Um, it's still the third there, though, isn't it? Don't the fireworks happen on the fourth? I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, enjoy the fireworks, Jay. Um, yes. So I assume you guys have the fireworks the night before the uh, big event. See, we... Uh, in this part of the world, 
we have the fireworks on the evening of, not the night before. Because um, uh, it is, yeah, it is the it is still the third over there, I understand. Um, all right, okay, well, I've been waffling on here for way too long. It's time to get these caps off and start doing what I uh, said I would do, and that is recap this thing. So, let's go. As usual, I've got my little heat shields here, which are my little plastic, my little metal blades with the spring on them to hold them up. Uh, we're going to put this here in between that plastic to make sure I don't melt anything. And then we're going to get the old hot air station. We're going to fire that up. And we're going to whip some of these caps off. Whip, whip, whip. I make it sound like it's some sort of, you know, fast paced, exciting thing, and it's really not. Still a third over there. That's good. That's what I. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So there's just someone getting a little bit premature with the fireworks over there for Jay. Right. Hot air station. Uh, as I, uh, I do mention often, I do have information about all the equipment I use in the description. Uh, I have not only the equipment I use, but I also have a few lower cost alternatives if people want to... Uh, oh, wow, smell. If people want to, uh, you know, if they want to spend a little less than uh, uh, than some of this equipment, because I do realise that it does all add up. This little white blob here is a piece of component adhesive that I want to remove because it will make life difficult for me when I go to put a new cap on. And it's a lot easier to remove while it's a, a still a little warm. Not all of the Max use component adhesive. It's just to do with the way they were built at the time. Uh, there would be a machine that basically grabs the components and sticks them in place. Um, and uh, they would be stuck on, well, actually, the first thing that happens, the machine sticks a glob of component adhesive everywhere. Oh, pop, we had a pop. Uh, yeah, so you would, a machine would go around and stick a little glob of adhesive in all the spots. And then another machine would come along and stick all the components in place, a little robot. And then uh, those components would then be stuck on the board but not soldered. And then they would basically go through a solder bath, which, um, uh, which actually solders the components. So that's why they have this component adhesive on. Um, I do actually have some component adhesive, component adhesive here. I've used it in the past when I've had a situation where uh, a... Um, uh, where a um, uh, there were some really badly damaged traces uh, and pads, and I'd got to the point where the component had nothing to solder onto on the board, so I glued the component onto the board and then ran wires from it, so it was nice and secure, um, and it worked. Well, the repair worked. The computer didn't work. Uh, well, it hasn't yet. There's a lot more wrong with it. That was one of the repairs I did on a board that's a mini repair type board. All right. Oh, I should always mention, guess what I didn't mention? I didn't mention Cheat Sheet. Yes, siree. Recapamac.com.au or recapamac.com, they both work. You will find a whole bunch of these recapping guides in the resources menu and you will find them for the 2CI. So uh, nice high res pics of the boards and little uh, guides showing where all the little capacitors go. So I'll be using that here. That's why I'm taking them all off and then put them all on. If I was didn't have a guide, I'd probably take them off and put them on one at a time so I didn't get all mixed up. I didn't take the adhesive off this one, did I? Gotta heat that up. There we go. Uh, let's just check here. Um, no, 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 no. They're likely to shoot guns off on the fourth. Okay, well, I guess as long as there's no one in the line of them. Um, right, so we've got some more cap removal here. Oh, that looks like a spider's leg. You can't see it because I'm not looking through the microscope view. Here we go. Now we're looking through. Yeah, look at that spider's leg, daddy long legs or something like that. Lovely. Um, all right, let's continue with this. I'm not using heat shields here because there's nothing here that really needs protecting. Um, this big capacitor up here, although it's going to melt a little bit, uh, I'm going to be removing it. So I care little. 
We've got a 10 microfarad 16 volt, and I'm telling you, there's some smells coming. There's some smells. For anyone who has never recapped before, um, the electrolyte that leaks out of these caps when you hit it with the heat, the hot air station, this is blowing air out at about 400, about around about 400 degrees Celsius. When that hot air comes out, it heats up that electrolyte and woo, it smells. Okay, here's a big old board. Uh, at least the smells are warm, this is true, this is true. I mean, it's, this time of year is probably a much better time for me to be doing this than, say, in the summer. In the summer, it gets so hot in this uh, in this little uh, workshop slash studio. Um, okay, here we go. I am uh, working on a video at the moment, which I will be releasing in the not too distant future. I've got a few videos on the way. I've been doing a lot of live streaming. For anyone who's been watching the live streams, they will know that I've been doing a lot of live streaming. And one of the reasons why I do a lot of live streaming is because they're very easy to do. I basically come down here, I've got work to do, I switch the camera on, I press go live, and uh, I'm making a video. The When I do the pre-recorded stuff, of course, I like to script it, I like to have intros, I like to, you know, I like to make them look a little bit flash and professional, um, and they take a lot of time. But having said that, a lot of the pre-recorded ones that I do are more successful. They, I get a lot more views on them, so I really do need to add a few more of those. Um, and I am planning to do a video. I'm going to be doing a couple of soldering videos, just showing a few different techniques of uh, soldering, you know, surface mount through hole, that sort of stuff, and uh, 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 reboiling VGA chips. Had a couple of requests for that. And um, uh, I'm also uh, working on a video at the moment uh, of me wrestling with a uh, an Apple Lisa. Um, I, anyone who watched the Mac Yak show yesterday, I chatted about that a little bit. I um, uh, had an opportunity to work on an Apple Lisa. Um, and... Um, and I had never used one before, so I basically rolled the camera while I sat in front of it and tried to figure out how they work, because they don't work the same as a Mac, I can tell you that for sure. Um, and so I'm going to just basically release that as a video. It's a little bit self-indulgent, I know, but it's basically just me going, what's going on here? How do I do that? Given the amount of gunk on this board, the traces are incredibly clean, which is great saves me from a bit of hassle. This is definitely going to want quality time in the ultrasonic cleaner and it will come out of the ultra pull afterwards. Uh, these two CI boards don't fit into my ultrasonic cleaner in one go. I have to actually do them uh, twice. I have to clean them uh, in you know one half and then flip them over and clean the other half. Uh, what have we got? Laura Layton, hello. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just keep, I'll keep this on me at the moment, keep me nice and warm. Yeah, nice. Uh, less damaging than the tutorial I watched where they cut the caps in half with pliers and pulled them off the board in pieces. Yeah, I, I don't like that way method of doing it. And I've, I've mentioned that in a couple of videos. The, the people that do it that way swear by it. They say it's quicker, it's easier, it doesn't do any damage. If that's the way they want to do it, that's fine. But as I have said in some of my videos before, I have had boards sent to me with damage caused by people doing it that way. Um, it's just, so I will never condone it. I'll never recommend it. Um, and that's just, that's that. I will never say to someone that's the best way to do it. Other people say it's the way to do it and people follow it and some people have had success with it. So, well, fine. Um, apparent temperature is 1.2 degrees Celsius. That's cold. That is really cold. What's all that about? Um, so, uh, I've never seen one in person before. Uh, neither had I until this one, uh, arrived at my, uh, at my house and I didn't even know it was coming. Um, uh, there's the customer was dropping off a couple of computers for me to repair and said, oh, and I've got this as well. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a Lisa. It was a Lisa two actually. It's the one with a three and a half inch floppy drive. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was, 
yeah, it was, it was quite something else. I mean, I was, it was, I just loved having that time to spend with it and sort of fiddle around. It was a, you know, a real, real piece of history. It's fantastic. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, interestingly enough, this one works beautifully, this particular Lisa. Uh, I mean, it, it had problems before it came to me, but now it works beautifully. Uh, it had problems associated with the power supply. Um, and it actually ended up putting a different power supply in it because it originally came with a power supply that would only uh, supply, would only work from 110 volts for the US power, but over here in Australia we use 240 volts. So the customer got hold of a, a power supply that could be converted into 240 volts, which was done, and uh, but it had other problems. So I repaired those problems. So yeah, just plug in and go. Amazingly enough, they don't have shutdown. They don't have a shutdown from the menu. Uh, when you finish working with them, you literally just press the power button and it's, it starts the shutdown process by itself. So you press the button and it comes up and says the computer is shutting down. It takes a few seconds and then it just switches off. Free. Nifty. Um, do certain Macs have better solder masks that protects the trace from capacitor gunge? Yes, definitely. Um, there are some that are the, where the, the mask is very, very thin. And comes off really, really easy, and somewhere it's quite a bit thicker. Um, in the summer, there you probably won't need to use the hot air station to remove the gaps. Yeah, it gets a bit warm here, and apparently it's going to keep getting warmer. So that's that's something to look forward to. Um, you should have done a stream on the Lisa. Look, I should have. There are a couple of things wrong with the Lisa. First of all, they are huge. I mean, huge. It, however big you think they might be from a picture you've seen, they're actually bigger. Uh, they are massive, so I couldn't even get it down here. I would have to stream from up in the main part of the house, which means it kind of eliminates me doing any repairs on it. I could have pulled the power supply out and done that down here, but what good is it looking at a power supply in a live stream? A bit dull. Um, so, uh, um, and the other thing was that I hadn't really had a chance to have a chat to the owner about how she felt about, you know, me doing videos on on her computer you know they're very rare they're very valuable and I didn't want to just go in and live stream it without her say so now I did actually speak to her and say look you know I'm planning a video is that okay and she said oh absolutely no problem at all um, and so um, so I ended up doing a pre-recorded video instead of a live stream um, so it's you know I, I know it's not the same but you know it's better than nothing so um, all right now uh, and the next thing we have to do is take off these uh, axial capacitors that we have here. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Da -da. Um, I have one of these solder sucker type machines, which I have used, um, but I have actually found that I find removing these with my old method probably, probably a little easier. So I'm just going to use my old method and we'll go through that. Pardon me. Um, Sam Puna, uh, Emily and Sam say hello from Birmingham, Alabama. Is that Alabama? I assume. Um, I, I'm not familiar with all of the two um, two state two letter state abbreviations, but I'm assuming that's Alabama. I could be wrong. Hello, um, hello to you both. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick look on here. I've dropped down to 20 viewers. I must be getting boring. Let's speed things up, shall we? All right, so. Uh, let's, this is how I, I remove these axial caps. Uh, this is a method that I recommend for anyone. And the main reason for that is that you don't need a solder sucker. You don't need, um, uh, you know, sort of any sort of really fancy equipment. You can just do this with a soldering iron, uh, some wick and a pair of tweezers. So, um, I just cut, I basically, well, and obviously some cutters, I just cut the soldering iron. Uh, the uh, sorry, I cut the uh, the capacitor off just like that, leaving a little bit of the pin still in there. I might do a little bit of zoom if I can. I mean, it's a little bit hard because I can't actually control the direction of it. So when I zoom, it just sort of zooms all over the joint. Uh, let's see, we can look at it like that. That's not bad. That's not bad. Might even be able to zoom in some more. Look at that. 470, 16, and 220. You can even see the numbers. And the focus is going nuts. Stop it. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to cut, cut, leaving some pin in there. Cut, cut. 
There we go. And just make sure you don't cut yourself on these little bits sticking out. I'll do this one here, which is going to be off camera now. Sorry, but it's the same thing. Uh, and then we get this under the microscope. Uh, like it is. Okay, so that's the pin right there and close to the middle. I get my so trusty soldering iron. It's not just a soldering iron, it's a trusty one. Um, yeah, I'm Perry okay. Uh, Oh, we are big fans. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for uh, for watching. Makes it worthwhile for me. <clears throat> okay, we've got folks from all over the place. All right, so I've got a little bit of flux on this pin now, and then I've got some solder here on my left hand. I've got my soldering iron in the right hand, and I'm going to apply some heat to that pin, and I'm going to get some solder all over it, and so I'm kind of encapsulating that pin trying to encapsulate that pin in some solar and I'm failing dismally what's going on here's me trying to say yeah this is the easy method and I'm just getting nowhere I need to get this hot get hot there we go now it starts to wiggle and then I'll just get my tweezers my tweezers and keep that heat on there and I'll just pull those out it's fine now we've got a great big glob of solder there that's all right we'll deal with that afterwards just let's, let's just get all these pins out Okay, I'm just being told by one of my fellow Mac Yakers that he is, has been unable to join my stream. Oh my goodness. Oh, the humanity. All right, let's get some more flux on here. Magic flux. This is the flux that I don't like, which is why I'm using it for cleaning and not for actual soldering. And there we go. We've got now fresh solder on there. We've got this wiggling around, and then we just pull the pin out. Nice and easy. No, Just here on eBay a few weeks ago, but it seems to be lost in the mud. Oh no, that is a travesty. I hope lost doesn't mean someone pinched it. Um, I really hope that 2CI gets found and arrives. I've actually got a, a little multimeter that I ordered from China about two months ago, which seems to have gone missing. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. I don't even know that it ever left there, left China. Um, and if you're wondering why I'm buy, buying a multimeter when I clearly already have one, um, no, not clearly, because it's buried under a mound of stuff. I have one. Uh, I have a couple, actually. This one that I've bought is a really little one. I wanted a very, very portable little one, so I bought a good quality, teensy-wincy one. So let's just uh, keep going pulling these pins out. Some of the pins are harder to get hot than others, and that's because they're on a ground plane. There's a great big piece of ground copper running across the board, which sucks all the heat away. And then it just gets hard to get the pin hot. Um, right, okay, there's a strange comment, but I don't know what that means. Um, all right, there we go. Should just... Uh, do this quickly. I'm just going to jump across to here. I'm going to go to oh, do not disturb because I really don't want notifications coming in while I'm live streaming. <sighs> ah, someone from Mexico. Hello, Rafael J. Salcedo. Um, okay, so oh, we've got I think I've got three more pins to remove, so we're getting there, and then we just have the joy of getting the solder out from them. That is sometimes super easy, that is sometimes super hard, and uh, time will tell. Sometimes the soldier just doesn't want to come out, it's just like, no, nah, I want to be here, I want to stay here, stop trying to get me out. Just got to move my microscope a little bit here. Oh yeah. Add some more, oopsie, there goes my alcohol. Let's, uh, you know, like isopropyl alcohol. It's not like a glass of scotch or something like that. Um, right. Okay. Get in there. Come on. This one is, I'm having trouble getting heat where I want with this one. So this one is probably, well, actually you can see it. You can see this great big green thing underneath there. That's one great big strip of copper 
and that is just sucking all the heat away from my soldering iron and from this pin that's making it very difficult for me to get it hot. Now that's not to say I won't, and I'll get there eventually, but it's just going to take some time. It's going to suck getting the solder out of that though. There we go, there's the pin. Um, Mm -mm. There we go, that one was nice and easy. I say that, but it's still not out. There we go. All right, so that's all the pins out. Now we've got the next step of getting the solder. Oh, pardon me. Oh, I haven't had breakfast, so my tummy's saying, hey, what's, what are you doing? Um, Michael Mullet, love watching work. Thank you very much. Um, I try to make it interesting. I looked away for a second and heard that, whoopsie, there goes my alcohol. <laughs> Oh uh, dear, yes, yes. It would be a, yeah, I mean, look, it's Saturday. I could if I wanted to. But generally I reserve drinking before midday for very special occasions such as like uh, Christmas or New Year's or something like that. Um, on the whole, I have a, a rule. I don't start drinking before five. Um, I do sometimes break that rule. Um, again, on special occasions. Um, I work from home, um, as I've mentioned before. I, I am a programmer and I work from home. And this one's going to really suck getting solar out of. Um, and uh, since the whole uh, COVID thing, my wife has been working from home as well. So I, I, I am not required to go pick her up from the train station or anything like that at the moment. We're just here at home. And it's really difficult for uh, when it comes to like, you know, I don't know clock ticks over five o'clock and finish work. It's very hard to not just go, hey, let's just have some wine. Um, it's scary. I'm just going to scrape some of this uh, black gunk off this little round pin here. It might make it a little bit easier for me to get solder onto that and therefore get heat to it. I will probably end up having to get the solder out of this from the other side of the board because I just don't think I'm going to get anywhere with the... Uh, with the wick, the solder wick method um, on this one. It's just, it's just, it's too, too nasty. Uh, it's, it's just, it's sucking all the heat away. Okay, there we go. That's working a little bit better now. I'm getting a nice blob. So let's just see what happens. Christmas, birthdays, Apple One recappings. <laughs> My Apple One is just, it's, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? When you think about, it's such a basic computer. I've got a replica. I built a, a kit, an Apple One replica kit. And, um, oh, look, you know, I mean, it's fun, but it's a very impractical computer. You can't really do that much with it. Um, but I suppose it's a little bit like an Altair, isn't it? I mean, if, if I had an Altair, if someone, if I had an opportunity to own an Altair, I would grab it, but you can't do much with it. Um, anyone who's not familiar with an Altair, you know, it's a very important computer in the history of personal computing. It was arguably the first sort of personal computer, and it was one made by, oh, what was the name of the company? In Texas. Um, and uh, it was a kit. You built it yourself, and then you could program it with switches on the front. And then there was a copy, which was, I think, was an inside. And then there was, I think, a, was it Conemco or something like that? I can't remember the names of some of these companies. They're all gone now. Um, none of these companies exist anymore. Uh, Carlos, hello. Thank you for joining. All right. This is the dull bit. I'm sorry. This is the cleaning bit. I don't know, I have said, had some people saying in the stream, oh, I like just sitting there watching you clean. It's like, yeah, but, yeah, but it's hard for me to make interesting. I do it in my movie voice. This summer, we suck the solar from a 2CI. That one's being mean. That one's better. This is looking better. 
There we go, look at that. Okay, so how are we doing here? Let's flip it over on the other side of the board and see if we have any, any, any more luck there. Um, okay, Mitz, that was it. Mitz, Mitz was the Altair company. Well done, thank you, Dana. Dana is, clearly has the same interest in uh, uh, vintage computing that I do. Um, and uh, right, um, yeah, micro instrumentation and telemetry system. Same with Trina. Trina definitely has the same interest as well. Um, I'm sure that um, for um, uh, for these people that uh, I'm talking to, if I was to tell them about or mention um, Triumph of the Nerds, they would know what I was talking about. It's uh, a uh, uh, three-part documentary series uh, made by uh, Bob X. Cringely. It's not his real name, but it's the name he goes under. Um, and uh, yeah, he was, uh, I really, really enjoyed that series. It was wonderful sort of uh, telling of the history of personal computing. Oh, I'm hearing that noise. There's this bubbling noise that I end up hearing. And I was like, what's that noise? It's the sound of my immersion heater starting to boil the water of my ultrasonic cleaner. <laughs> uh, I try and stop it before then. Right. Okay. Duo dock and it still works. Wow. That's amazing. With the dock, the the dock and the computer, I know that the, one of the big issues with uh, with those things were that they uh, there weren't just weren't many docks around. There were lots of the laptops, but not many docks. Um, they have some sort of componentry in them, don't they? I think they, I could be wrong. I've never actually had one. I've never had access to one. But I think from memory, they have, um, they do have some electronics in them, don't they? I think. Um, okay. Yes, similar age, yes, indeed. The old farts, yes, indeed, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Um, the ones that were actually part of a lot of that. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't really around or into computers at the very early stages of sort of the personal computer industry, but I was getting into computers at age probably around about somewhere between eight and ten, I would say. Um, there we go. Okay, now, no, I just got to make sure I get these holes lined up. There we go, that's the right one. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I can't really tell you that much about the Duo Doc, Nick, I'm afraid, because as I say, I've never owned one, I've never had one here in the workshop. So I'm not of much use uh, on that, but someone else in the chat might know a little bit more about it. I'll tell you what, if uh, Steve from Mac84 was here, he'd probably be able to, uh, to give you a bit of information. Uh, the Mac Plus, uh, it still works great, including an external 30 megabyte SCSI hard drive. That is impressive. I'll tell you what, if you've got anything important on that hard drive you want to get off, do it now. Look at the way this solder just gets so stubborn sometimes. Come out, come out. Yeah. Nye. Nye. This is the most boring part. I think, without a doubt, getting the solder out of the uh, um, out of the, the holes. Um, I generally just add more solder because solder likes to hang out with other solder. So if you've got it a bit drenched, it often helps pull that solder out. Oh, I might get the rest of that from the other side. Look, that's actually a little hole there. Now, we've got that one. We've got that one, that one, that one, that one. This one I might just clean up a tiny bit. Board exploded spectacularly. Bought a recap kit for the whole board and got it. Okay, yeah, no worries. Um, that's excellent. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a um, a plus with a reefer 
cap on it, any reefer caps. If you've got anything with reefer caps on them, just replace them sooner rather than later. Um, they're not getting better with age, that's for sure. Okay, can I get that last little bit of solar out from this side? This one's the real troublesome one, this one. I think that's enough. I think I will probably be able to get the uh, pin through that hole. So I think we'll be fine. Um, so, ordered pizza while watching a live stream again. Yeah, I suppose it's getting close to lunchtime. Um, uh, five years since opening was uh, more, more max to work on. Okay, yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so I've, I, my experience with um, Max came from a pretty young age. I uh, uh, I didn't necessarily own one, um, but I got to use one quite early um, and just basically fell in love with them straight away. Being someone who had been using non-graphical user interfaces, the first time I used a graphical interface, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want one. You know, using Mac Paint for the first time was just extraordinary. Um, okay, so we're into the cleaning process now, which basically involves adding a little bit of flux to the pad, getting some solder onto the uh, onto the tip of my iron, and just gently working that solder with a little bit more flux here to try and get rid of all of the little bits of black on these pins. Um, I want to end up so that all of the pin, sorry, not pin, pad, so all of the pad will accept solder. Uh, if I can't do it all during this method, I then have to kind of do a bit of scrapey scrape. But I'm just going to grab some wick now. We've suck away all that solder, and we will, should leave two shiny, clean pins that look like brandy. Uh, I have found the two CI pins can or pads. I've got to keep saying pins. The two CI pads can be very uh, easy to lift off the board. So we're going to be very gentle with them. All I have right now are floppies. Yeah, that'll take you a while to get 30 megabytes off, won't it? especially when it's an 800k. <laughs> um, what I would recommend, I mean, look, I, I generally recommend with anyone who's doing sort of a bit of collecting of vintage Macs to get an external case, an external SCSI case with uh, something in it, whether it be a, an actual spinner hard drive or a SCSI 2SD. I have one of these. Uh, this is a SCSI 2SD version 5.5. Now they need to be sort of fiddled with a little bit to work properly on a Mac Plus, but you can get them to work on a Mac Plus. And once you have them sort of all formatted and everything, you need to copy stuff onto it. And I mean, this here has a 16 gigabyte SD card in it. Now on those old Macs, they can't do any, they won't recognize anything larger than a two, two gigabyte partition. But what I generally do is, so that I don't end up with 50 million hard drives coming up on the screen, I just format it, usually half of it. So I do four two gigabyte partitions, so essentially eight gigabytes. And on all those old Macs, that is so much space. Uh, um. <laughs> Soldering, wick rubbing, alcohol and toothbrush. Yes, indeed. I did no toothbrush on that one. But as you can see, it, it, it pays off. I mean, look at those pads. Look at them. They're all ready for new solder to go on. Delicious. Delicious. All right, let's get some more solder onto this. That's fantastic. Well, look at that. There's some black on this. That'll probably come off with the uh, wick, though. Because when I wick off this uh, solder, I also use it to sort of do a little bit of gentle rubbing on the pads. And that gentle rubbing uh, generally gets any of that last black scunge off there. <clears throat> yes, what's the what sort of pizza just got ordered? I need to know. See, it's making me hungry. I love pizza. Actually, that's what 
You could suggest that for dinner tonight. Hmm. Pizza. And I'll tell you another thing, I absolutely adore cold pizza. And at the end of the night, whatever piece, pieces of pizza you didn't eat, you just stick in the fridge. And then the next morning, up you get cold pizza. I love that. It's free with olives, anchovies, and camembert. Ooh, fancy. <laughs> Once again, this is the boring, repetitious bit. I am just working my way through all of these pads. Um, always on the lookout for um, you know anything that might sort of cause an issue. Um, for example, on some of these boards, they have a little bit of a dip at the join from the pad to, you can see the little black line from the pad to the uh, trace. And Sometimes that can result in uh, like a, a point where there's a, a much higher likelihood of corrosion and potentially breaking. Certainly on the Mac uh, Color Classic, uh, around the sound chip, it has those little dips on the pads and they break all the time. And then I have to go and do trace repairs on them. But I can always just get my multimeter on bibbity bit mode and check. And we're good. We're good. <sighs> I think my region is now nine weeks coronavirus free. Yeah, excellent. That is good to hear. Okay. It would appear that the uh, the people that started panic buying toilet paper again last week or the week before or whatever, it was fairly short-lived. They got it out of their system very quickly. And I believe there's toilet paper back on the shelves, which is great. As someone did comment, can you imagine what would happen to the toilet paper if there was a pandemic with something that did actually give you uh, the trots? Yeah, I mean, we're in, um, I'm in Sydney here, and uh, this obviously, it's the most populous uh, city in, uh, in Australia, and we are basically down to, I think the only new cases that we've been getting are people who have come here from overseas, they've been put in quarantine, and then they've, they've uh, been tested after quarantine and found to have it. So to some extent, that's going to happen. There's nothing you can really do about that as long as it's being, you know, it's being properly managed. Uh, I don't think there have been any community uh, transmitted cases here in quite some time. Uh, so they're definitely starting to relax things here in terms of what we are and aren't able to do. Um, there are still a fair few restrictions around, but uh, at least businesses are able to operate and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so we've got through that little cluster there. Why don't we do that little one on its lonesome? Where is he? He's, uh, where is he? Where? Where, where, where? Oh, here he is. Yep. So one's sitting down here underneath the new bus slot. Um, interesting thing about the Macintosh 2CI is it was the very first modular Macintosh. By modular, I mean one that you could expand, put cards in and stuff like that, as opposed to a compact Mac. It was the first of the modular Macs to have its own built-in video. The Mac 2, the Mac 2X, the Mac 2CX, um, FX, I can't remember. I don't think the FX had video, yeah. Um, this one actually had its own, it's pretty lame, but it had its own video um, output. So you could plug a monitor straight into the motherboard. You didn't need a display card. Um, I used to have an old Mac 2, and of course that, without a display card, you didn't get a display. Um, but this one, you can still put a display card in it if you want to 
have more fancy graphics, you can put uh, your own display card in there. Uh, got a little bit of uh, corrosion going on there, trace corrosion. I'm just going to clean up and get some uh, solder on that, make it all nice and tidy. And I just saw, saw something out of the corner of my eye, just a little bit of darkening on these traces here. So I'm going to do the same with those. Just Again, this is just a little bit of future proofing, uh, preventing future corrosion. And so I'll just do that. And then we'll get our wick. It's got a little bit of solder on it already. And we'll just give that a bit of a rub. And that will get them all coated. And then I'll probably put a little bit of UV solder mask on that afterwards. Just help protect it. We want these things to last as long as possible. <sighs> Use that one. Um, sound is not working, believe it's because of what you mentioned. Is that repairable, the sound chip? Well, it's, um, there are kind of, if it's, if it is just um, either broken traces or electrolyte or, you know, so first of all, it has to be recapped. Okay, that's the first thing. If it hasn't been recapped, it has to be recapped first. The, um, um, because there are electrolytic capacitors that fail around the sound chip that if they fail, you won't get sound. So that's the first thing, recap. Second of all, the, um, uh, the other thing is obviously cleaning because you get a lot of electrolyte around that sound chip and so that all has to be cleaned out. So you've got to make sure that's really, really clean, toothbrush and alcohol, whatever, you know, get that as clean as possible. Now, after all of that, if you're still not getting sound, then there are a couple of things it could be. One, it could be rotted traces around the sound chip that you need to obviously repair. Um, or it can be the sound chip has failed altogether. I've had that happen on a few of them as well. They get, you know, shorted out by the electrolyte, and then they stop working. Um, so that's kind of, um, that's the whole thing with the sound. And then of course, once you have done all those things, if you're still not getting sound, the next thing you need to do is you need to check um, if you get sound through headphones. Uh, and that just helps you isolate whether the issue is the sound chip or potentially the amplifier. Um, so anyhow, that's that's it. I've said my bit. Um, there we go. I'm going to have to probably put some UV solder mask on that, unfortunately. We all hate it when that happens, don't we? Because that means it stops me from finishing the recapping because I have to wait for the mask to dry and all sorts of terrible things happen. And, um, Right, um, back to full-time work now, awesome. Still nice to be iPhone custom too, which is not nice. Yeah. crap <laughs> oh that's funny uh dear, i like that um okay so we're getting along here i think i've got three more to do three more to clean up four more to clean up and then we can uh move on to the uh the next stage in this exciting exciting episode mm -hmm. I love the 2CI. I've mentioned this, I think, in my streams before. It's one of the Macs that I really like, and that has to do with the fact that I did I did use these in the studio that I worked in, and um, we just didn't have... They were the fastest computer in the place. Anyone who got a chance to use them was like, yeah, have a go at that. Uh, we were using them using, I think, System 608 from memory would have been the OS we were using. Uh, we were using applications such as Adobe Illustrator and Quark Express. I can't remember which versions of these, possibly Illustrator 3 or 88. Um, uh, 88 was first. I, uh, there was Illustrator 1, then there was Illustrator, I think, 88, and then 3. Um, 3 was a big improvement, big improvement. Um, I think 3 you could actually edit in preview mode. I think that was one of the big things. And then, uh, yeah, Quark Express would have been version probably 3.1, something like that. 
Okay, so yes, uh, the that's actually you've got that around the wrong way there, Dana. Um, the the CX is the rubbish version of the CI. The VI is the rubbish version of the VX. So they actually swapped it around for the VI and VX. The VI, the VX was the good one. The VI was the bad one. So you know who knows? So they actually went and altered their own system there. The crazy, crazy people there at Apple. Um, um, sound is coming out of the headset port. If I plug external speakers. That that tells me that you've probably got an issue with, uh, well, it, it could be the speaker, of course, but it's probably on the analog board because the amplifier, I'm pretty sure the amplifier for the sound is on the analog board of the Color Classic. So um, you are probably going to need to recap the analog board and have a look at that. So there are a few videos on my channel for that, um, removing the analog board and recapping it. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind. Do you use Branson EC ultrasonic cleaning solution in your cleaner? Hello, Francis B. Thank you very much for that question. It's a very good one. Um, no, I don't. Uh, I use a product that I buy from an Australian company, a company in Queensland called Electro. It's made by a company called Clean Tech. Now, I've been very happy with this. The downside, of course, is that it comes from Queensland. It takes a little while to arrive. And I just get lazy sometimes and don't order it with enough time. And then I get desperate because I'm waiting for it to arrive. So I started looking for a place that sells it, sells something that I could use locally. And there's a company that I use called RS Components and I buy all of my capacitors and stuff from. And they're actually quite close to me and they have free next day delivery. And that's quite appealing. So if I've run out of something, I can just go, oh, I order that and bang, it's on my doorstep the next day. Very, very handy. What... Um, and so what I bought was this stuff here called Ambacil. Now, I this is stuff that I heard about through um, Paul Daniels, who has his channel on repairing Macs. He's, that's the one he uses, apparently, Ambacil. Now, I tried this, and I can't stand it. Uh, it I, I don't like it at all. So this I don't like, but I do like the clean tech. Now, ha, on the Branson EC, as far as the people that I know in the States that have ultrasonic cleaners, that's what they use. And it is my understanding that's the way to go. It's good quality stuff. It's good for cleaning, blah, 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 blah. I can't really get it here in a cost-effective way. There is no local seller of it. Um, they uh, The only way I can get a Branson EC here is to actually uh, buy it from an, an overseas seller and then obviously pay the shipping to get it over here and it's expensive because it's a chemical and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, a short answer is no, I don't use it, but that's not necessarily because it's bad. It's just because it's really not uh, not not easy for me to get hold of, and I've been really happy with this stuff called Clean Tech. For, sorry, called Electro from Clean Tech. It's been really good, so I'm sticking with them. Uh, it comes in a concentrate, so I put in. I think you put it in one part to ten or something like that. So if I put in five liters, I put in five hundred mils, five liters of water. I put in five hundred mils of the uh, of the solution. Um. Uh, oh, Oz Retro Comp. Okay, off to Aaron. I understand that. Saturday is the day for Aaron. So thank you for joining and see you later. Um, I quite understand. As I, I'm the same. I mean, virtually, probably the moment I finish this, I'll have to go and do some errands. Um, okay. Okay. I don't. Cleaner from mouse, and last time you said you would use the ultrasonic with the solution followed by dipping the board in IPA to get a clean board. Yeah, so um, I left the residue on the board in my case. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I definitely don't get residue on my board unless um, I have uh, I haven't cleaned the water in the ultrasonic cleaner for a while. So um, I. The, the whole thing is what is leaving the residue, you know, what's actually causing that residue to come, you know, to end up on there. So it's either that the isopropyl alcohol is not pure, it has something else in it, some sort of, um, I don't know, uh, cleaning solution or something like that, you know, because things like, if you take, for example, things like rubbing alcohol, they might only be like 70% alcohol and then the rest is other things in there. So what's being left behind the residue is it's it's something that residue is something there now my ultrasonic cleaner i use distilled water and the cleaning solution 
So none of the minerals or anything that are in water, because obviously just tap water has a lot of minerals and impurities and stuff in it. And if you wash something with tap water and then you get it completely dry, uh, during the evaporation, all of those, those impurities are left on the board. So the, the residue has to be from something. So it's either something in the isopropyl alcohol or it hasn't been, or what was on the board before hasn't been properly washed off. Um, so I can't say for certain what those, in, you know, what what the residue is, but this cleaning process that I follow here with the ultrasonic into the uh, into the isopropyl alcohol and then into the oven, um, it, the boards come out spotless unless my ultrasonic cleaning fluid is dirty, and then you know sometimes I get little bits of gunk and stuff left behind. So that's, I, as I, I can't answer your question exactly, but I'm just sort of offering some possibilities. Uh, right, so how high do you heat your cleaner? I, I have it on the, about 60 degrees Celsius, um, which is, if anyone has a Google there, can convert it into Fahrenheit if anyone needs it. But yeah, 60 degrees Celsius is the cleaning temp that I use. Um, I am actually planning to do a video on ultrasonic cleaners in the not too distant future because I do want to talk about the process because I think there's a little bit of confusion about what an ultrasonic cleaner actually is. Um, and you see that when you, you look at some videos on YouTube where someone might say, oh, look, I've, uh, I've made my own ultrasonic cleaner here using a, uh, I've got a bucket and a, and a, um, and, a, and an orbital sander and I've attached the orbital sander and I've put something in the bucket and it's come out clean. That's not an ultrasonic cleaner. That's not using ultrasonic sound to clean. That's using vibration from the, uh, um, from the orbital sander, uh, which is a process of agitation. Uh, whereas ultrasonic cleaners use a process called cavitation. And it's the uh, ultrasonic sound passing through the water actually causes the water molecules to break apart. And that leaves a very, very high temperature air void, tiny weeny little air void. Um, and that little air void is what does the cleaning. Um, and, and it is, a, you know, it is, it's, a, it's, it's sort of, it's a very specific process that can only be done with ultrasonic sound. And that is sound, um, I think the lowest sound that you would use for ultrasonic would be probably um, 20 kilohertz this cleaner that I use emits sound at 40 kilohertz. So that's fairly standard for ultrasonic cleaners to emit sound at 40 kilohertz. Some of them will go much, much higher. Higher frequency produces smaller um, uh, cavities, uh, so smaller little voids. Um, so the lower, the larger the void and the smaller the smaller. And that, you know, is useful for cleaning really, really small things. But... Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, but there is, look, there really is, um, ultrasonic cleaners are really, really good for certain tasks. They're not good for everything, but they're really good for certain tasks. Um, and when it comes to cleaning, uh, you know, uh, electronics like this, they're absolutely fantastic. Because they're, they do an amazing job cleaning, but they're incredibly gentle on all of these components and the plastics and all that sort of stuff. The only things that get affected for me with the ultrasonic cleaner, and that is, I think, to do... Well, it's probably to do with both the process and the detergent, is aluminium or aluminium. Um, when I put uncoated aluminium in there, uh, it, it tarnishes the surface. It creates like a blackening of the surface. It doesn't seem to do it any harm, but it just creates a blackening of it. So uh, that's just something worth uh, keeping in mind. Ah, right, okay. 140 Fahrenheit, that's good to know. Did Steve ever ultrasonic clean the horrendous classic board covered in battery scunge? Now, that's a good question. So, that is a good question. Now, he, so he, basically Steve bought an ultrasonic cleaner. He got a slightly larger one than mine. It's a different brand. His is like a T-Bone or something, I can't remember. Mine's a V-Bore. These are well-known brands, of course. <laughs> um, so they're just, you know, it's nice they put a brand name on them, but at the end of the day, it's just um, it's cheap stuff from China. And um, he bought one cheaper than mine, 
but very, very similar. The control panel is the same. Now, when he got it delivered and he plugged it in, it just started immediately making horrendous sounds before even switching it on. And I was like, whoa, what's going on there? So he went and contacted the place and said, oh, look, you know, I want my money back or whatever. And they came back with a, a little video saying, oh, this is a manufacturing fault. Here's how you fix it. Um, and uh, which is just unbelievable, let's face it. Um, you buy something in good faith as a working new thing, and then they send you a video showing how you repair the broken thing they just sent you. Um, and he um, uh, he opened it up and he did the repair, um, and it works now. Um, now, having said that, I don't know how much ultrasonic cleaning he has actually done with it. I know he did do an 840 board, but I don't know if he's done any more. Um, I know his primary focus was on his Quadra 840, trying to get that going. Um, still not going, by the way, but, you know, it's an unhappy board, that's for sure. I thought I'd finished, but I just realised there was one more cap that I hadn't done. <clears throat> I have to say that this particular ultrasonic cleaner that I bought, I've been really happy with. Um, it has four, um, what do they call them, transducers, I think, ultrasonic transducers on them. They're the, they're the things that emit the sound. It has four of them underneath. Steve's one, which is slightly bigger than mine, has six. Um, but yeah, it has four of those um, transducers or, you know, those sound emitters on the bottom. Um, and it's got a little heater on there and it's got a thermostat, so that keeps the temperature uh, steady. The heater is unbelievably slow, but I've got a little immersion heater to speed that process up. I've actually got two. I bought one just the other day. It's a 2000 watt heater. It heats a thing at about five minutes flat. So, mate, hello. All right, okay, so we have finished, I think. Let's just check. <laughs> Better check. Is a, hey, oh, what's happened to my keyboards? Oh, my quick keys have stopped working again, so I'll have to go and do it the old fashioned way. Side angle. I'm a bit zoomed in there, aren't I? Wide. Let's see all the mess and the toothbrushes and the things. I have several toothbrushes in here for cleaning. Uh, I have this one here is for cleaning flux because this one gets really, really scummy. This one here is for cleaning. This one's for cleaning uh, uh, heat sinks, the um, uh, thermal compound, thermal paste, you know, that you get on heat sinks because that gets in the toothbrush and I don't want to contaminate things with that stuff. And then this one is for cleaning dust. And so this one is meant to never be used with anything greasy or oily. It's meant to just be used with dust. However, I think this one has sometimes been used for stuff other than dust. And then I've also got this for dust as well. Clean a little bit of dust off of that. Um, right. Okay. So here we go. Side angle board. And I don't use any of those two brushes on my teeth. Sorry. Okay. How do you clean heat sinks? No, it's, I'm, I'm saying the wrong thing. It, it's not, I'm not actually using it for cleaning. I, I, I've written heat sink on there, but I use it for cleaning the chips after removing the heat sink. I don't have an example here. Um, or do I? Maybe. If I'm working on a board like this, there's a, there's a uh, MacBook Air. If I'm working on a board like this, when I take that heat sink off, it leaves behind the thermal compound. It's the grey stuff and it goes all kind of chalky and powdery after it's old the, with the stuff that Apple use. And when I clean that off, it, 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 uh, it as I say, because it's sort of all powdery, it, you know, it gets, it gets everywhere. And so that's why I, um, I have a specific toothbrush for that. So it's cleaning the thermal compound off the chips after the heat sink is removed. Removed. That makes more sense than what I said initially. Um, uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, right. Now, uh, if I am actually cleaning a heat sink, they, they generally don't get particularly dirty. Um, I, I just clean off the thermal compound and stuff like that. Um, Right, okay. Uh, or blow some dust out of them. Heat sinks get a lot of dust on them, so I usually blow the dust out of them. So we now have this all completely and totally cleaned and ready for new caps to go on. Uh, as usual, what I would normally do is I'd stick the, um, uh, the um, surface mount ones on first, but there is something I need to deal with, 
and I need to get some uh, UV uh, solder mask onto this one here where I exposed a little bit of the trace and I don't want to accidentally create a short when I go to put the component on. So I'm going to clean this up and then I'm going to paint a little bit of UV solder mask on it. So I'm going to have to go back to the microscope. Okay, I have to get it really clean before putting the mask on because uh, it needs to adhere to the um, it needs to adhere to the board. I don't want there to be any goop. Oh, where is it? Here it is. I keep my UV solder mask in a little metal container. Um, and then I have a couple, I bought a few extras because I keep losing them, of um, paint brushes that I use for painting the stuff on. They're like a triple zero artist's brush because I am such an artist. So I'm just going to paint some of this on. Look at this. I'll paint some on here as well, eh? With the UV solder mask, you never want to paint this stuff on too thick uh, because otherwise it dries on the outside and doesn't dry underneath. Um, so if you do need a thick coating, you need to do it in multiple coats. Paint some on, get it, let it dry, paint some more on, let it dry. It's much, much quicker to do it that way. Okay. Yes. Well, actually, uh, there's only one missing paintbrush at the moment. I did actually find one. The one that I lost for ages, I found it. Um, but yeah, the other one's around here somewhere. I ended up buying ones with great big thick handles, so they're a bit easier to find. Well, that was the theory. But as it turns out, with the thicker handles, they end up just looking like more of the other tools. They look like screwdrivers and stuff. <gasps> I found it. Found it. So there we go. Every paintbrush now accounted for. Now, to, clean, to dry the UV solder mask, uh, there are a couple of things I can do. I've got a... Um, uh, is that, none of these buttons are going to work, are they? No. I can use a... I can use this. This is UV lamp. Little LEDs. It's not switching on. Uh, that's because the plug has probably come out. Uh, but anyhow, if, if it was plugged in, this would actually be glowing blue Ooh. Um, because that's my UV lamp that I use to dry it. But I'm just looking outside at the moment. I see a bit of sunlight. If I can get this in the sun, it will dry way quicker. So just bear with me a second. I'm going to press this little back soon button. I'll be right back after putting this in the sun. I'm back. That won't take long. It is nice and sunny outside. A little bit windy too, but I keep doing that. I keep moving my screen every time I move my microscope. Sorry about that, people. We can do without that. It's like an earthquake. Now, what I'm going to do to just fill in time very, very quickly. Uh, oh dear. I hope it's this one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's this one. Okay. So, uh, someone was talking about before. Who was it? I can't remember. Let me have a look. Was it Francis? No, nope, it wasn't Francis. Uh, someone was asking me about a Macintosh Classic Color Classic with no sound. Now, I think we've established that it's probably your analog board because you're getting sound out of the audio speaker, uh, audio thingy. But uh, I just wanted to, while I'm here, oh, my quick keys, my quick keys. 
Um, uh, this is a color classic board. This is one sent to me before. This is one where a person recapped it themselves. It has some battery damage. It's not very nice. This one starts up, but uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't say it starts up. We get a, we get a power light, but it doesn't boot. It doesn't chime. Now. Uh, the sound chip is generally one of the problems that happens with that. Now this one here, the sound chip is in such good condition, I just don't think it's that. But, pardon me, I do want to eliminate that as a possibility. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on another sound chip rated from another computer. So I'm going to just quickly whip this off um, and, uh, and put this other sound chip on. Probably won't make any difference at all but I just want to do it just to, uh, to eliminate it. I, this was rated off a board that I believe was in 100% in working order, so I had every reason to think this sound chip is fine. It was taken off a Quadra 7, 475. They have the sound chip as the Color Classic, same sound chip. Well, as you can see, they're very similar there. I better zoom in there, you can see. Ooh. These sound chips are hard to procure, unfortunately. You really can only get them off other computers, but they have this number 343S0129, 343S0129, there we go. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to whip this sound chip off, I'm going to put this sound chip on while we wait for that UV solder mask to dry on the 2CI. And this is just one of the tasks I had for today, so I figured I may as well do it. Um, okay, so would UV solder mask eventually dry or does it have to cure it has to cure if you leave it I mean here's yeah if you basically just put a blob uh, on there without UV light I think it just stays liquid forever I mean it might eventually dry out I'm not sure but it seems to just stay liquid forever this has been recapped this one um, and there we go this one has been recapped uh, but it's been recapped with um, new uh, surface mount electrolytics rather than uh, tantalums, which is fine. I have no issue with that. Um, some people like to preserve the original appearance of their Mac, or they might simply have just said, well, that's what was on it, so that's what I'm going to replace it with, which is fine as well. Um, right, so let's just get a little bit of heat onto this, and let's try and remove this without um, melting anything. Just applying heat around all the edges, and eventually this will get warm enough that I can just whip it off. As I'm doing this, the chip gets warm, the board gets warm, you know, and then it'll just it'll just come off. I realise that it would be good if we could see this with a slightly wider view, but this is as wide as my microscope goes. I can actually see the whole chip through my viewfinder, uh, which just gives you an idea of the, the view I have compared to the view that you can see on the on the camera. So that's now off. As you can see, it looks pretty uh, squeaky clean. Where I would typically have problems with damaged traces on, oh, I have out of focus. Where I would typically have problems with damaged traces on these are around here. There, there, there. Not all of the, the Color Classic board, but some of them have um, have this little kind of dip uh, where the trace meets the pad, and they sometimes break there. So nasty. Um, you, when he would power off his machine, he had to unplug it too, otherwise it would reboot itself automatically. You know what? That may not actually be a problem. That might actually be a feature. One of the interesting things about the 2CI was they were so powerful at the time. People, they, they, people were using them as servers, as actual you know, server, servers that wanted to stay on all the time. So what uh, Apple did was they made a little switch. The switch at the back, the push button switch, if you rotate it 180 degrees, it's designed to be permanently pushed in. And when it's permanently pushed in, even if you shut the computer down, it just starts up again. So if you then rotate it 180 degrees, uh, it, the switch then comes back out again. And that means that it won't keep uh, automatically restarting it. Now, I'm not saying it's definitely that. It may not be that. But uh, that is one of the, as I say, features of the 2CI. 
It could also be that it needs recapping in the problems with the startup circuit. Ron, thank you very much for that uh, super chat. I do appreciate it. Uh, thanks for continuing to do these streams. Oh, I do love doing them. So um, now, uh, nice ones eventually get tacky and gross, like most uncured resin, but not set. Yes, that sounds about right. Um, okay. Isn't there someone in Brooklyn that does recapping of old classic Macs? There could well be. Um, I know that there was. Uh, there's basically Mac caps, um, and uh, I don't know where Mac caps is. It's uh, his name is Charles or something or other. I can't remember. Now it's my understanding that he had a few issues with his reputation due to life problems. I think he went through a few life problems and uh, a lot of people were very unhappy with his work, things not getting done, that sort of stuff. I don't know all the finer details. Um, I'm only telling you stuff that I have heard. I don't know if that is true, but I don't know where he is uh, based. Um, but that's the only other kind of, uh, maybe not now, but at the time, full-time recapper. He has a, a website, Matt Caps, with a few guides on it. Um, I think, uh, not all, but I've probably got most of the same things on my website. I use, obviously, much higher resolution photos, but that's because that's the whole reason why I started the website in the first place. I wanted really high-res images of logic boards, ones where you could actually read the numbers on the chips. So I started taking these photos for myself, and then I thought, oh, might as well share them. So on my Recapper Mac website, you'll find quite a few guides there of different computers and that. And I've still got a lot more to add. I've, I've created a lot of guides lately, and I haven't got them up on the website yet. So my apologeticals for that. Uh, I am also planning to do a giveaway for folks who are interested. I've got a couple of things here that I don't need that I was thinking about giving away. A couple of older but fully functional um, uh, PCIe um, graphics cards. Um, and I'm also going to be giving away a recapped and restored um, Macintosh 2VX. But of course, that one is probably going to be mainly focused at my Australian viewers because that's going to be very difficult to ship that to the States. Um, using hot air to remove the SMT electrolytic capacitor. Okay, so um, if there's a battery leakage on 2CI, how does the computer still turn on? It looks like it came from the back and shot all of the uh, way to the yeah. Well, how does it still turn on? Well, that's that's sort of it's, it can it, it might still. You know? I mean, when it comes to damage, damage you can have very small damage in a very crucial place, and the, the computer will stop working. And then you can have quite widespread damage in non-crucial areas, and the computer will still work. So, um, color classic is my favorite compact Mac, other than the SE30. Yes, I think that's probably most people's preference. Um, or a lot of people's anyway. Uh, is there any the damage to the logic boards when you use hot air to remove the SMT electricity capacitors? There is the potential of damage. Now, generally, if you're just removing these sorts of um, plastic, you know, chip, this is a PLCC chip, plastic leaded, uh, leaded chip carrier. Uh, these are generally fine. I mean, I, I've removed and put these on and I've hit them with hot air and they generally don't. They don't die. Um, but having said that, with a lot of the really old Macs that I work on, I will often shield the heat. Because um, I, I do worry, even if it's not going to do damage to the chip itself, it might do damage to the, um, uh, you know, the, the, sometimes they get really crusty solder on them and then that can make, that can weaken the joints and stuff like that. And, and if I don't want to have to go in and re-solder the component, then I have to be very careful. Um, but generally, I mean, because these are a carrier and the chip itself inside is a teeny weeny weeny little thing inside it, these are, are pretty resistant to heat. Um, so, what is the VLSI chip for? This one here? This one? Vilsi. Um, that's U16. I'll have to have a look at the, um, um, at the, what do you call that thing? The schematic. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I know I will have known at some stage, but um, I just, not all that stuff stays in my brain. I think it's essentially the kind of the link to everything. It's the one that ties everything together. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's, yeah, the thing that, you know, makes everything talk to everything else. I think that's what it does. 
that's all my fancy tech talk. All right, so now I'm going to stick my, let's make sure I got the right one. Yes, this is the one that I want to replace. Um, I'm really, really, and I mean this most sincerely, not expecting this to work. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway because, as I say, it's a process of elimination, but I don't think this is going to work. Paper Pro I've been playing with today, boot from the client's hard drive. Okay, good luck with that. Uh, which MacBook Pro is it? Just out of curiosity. So I'm going to ask you a question so you can't go and do it. Um, I'm just curious to know what size and what year. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I've actually got a couple of MacBook Airs here at the moment. I've got one that's giving me all sorts of grief because it's pulsing, uh, which means that there's probably a, um, a short to ground somewhere on one of the power rails, which is really annoying. I've got to find that. I've got, I know what I need to do with it, but I just haven't had the time yet. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's basically when you check the voltage on it, it's pulsing up and down. And that what that usually happens is is it tries to power up, then the voltage uh, is wrong because of a short or something like that. It's making the voltage pulling the voltage down, making it lower than it should be, or something like that. It then goes through a chip that says, "Hey, is all the power right?" And when it goes through that chip and the chip says, "No, the power is not right," it then powers it off. So it's sort of, it keeps trying to start. It keeps trying to start, it keeps going. It's power on, check the power, power's wrong, power off. And it just keeps going through that cycle over and over again. Um, so I am soldering here this PLCC chip, and as you can see, I'm just basically tack it down with a couple of pins to start off with. And then I go through and I do a nice juicy drag solder to solder all these pins. There's a, if you can hear that revving, there's a, uh, twit that lives behind me that has a really, really rubbish car that he likes to rev the bejesus out of on uh, weekends. And it's uh, kind of annoying because it's such a pissy sounding car in the first place. Right. It's, uh... And there is nothing worse than the sound of a revving, really hard revving four-cylinder engine. It's just a horrible sound in my opinion. That's just my opinion though. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Need a little bit more flux on this. That's why I keep getting a br I'm keep causing a bridge along here and that's because I need a little bit more flux there. I'm not at a very good angle I have to say. There we go, that looks better. Yep, that looks good. Oh, Jay is back. Hello, how were the fireworks? MacBook Pro 9.2, 9.2 with an i7 processor. Okay, fair enough. Um, that's flashier than I normally work on. I normally work on much older ones than that. Well, good luck with it. Uh, good luck with it, Trina. Let's hope that that uh, is uh, uh, successful. Come on. Oh, God. You bridge you. Right. Okay. That's it. Now, always a good idea when you've been doing one like this. It was good. Oh, that's good to hear. Uh, nothing like a burbling big, big block uh, loping lazily along. Yeah, I, I have to admit, um, you know, if I am going to listen to a, an engine rev, I would much rather listen to uh, an eight cylinder. Okay, just looking at this at an angle to make sure that all these pins look like they're soldered properly and that there are no bridges. And it looks good to me. So we may as well try it. Um, as I said, I think this has got about a, I don't know, one in 100 chance of actually fixing the problem, but I'm just doing it as a process of elimination. Uh, my key's still not working, my quick key's still not working, so side angle here. Whoops. That's weird. Oh, wow. I've got this, there's something wrong with this keyboard, I think. 
Oh, it's probably just OBS being stupid. We've got to zoom out for this. Zooming out, see all the mess. And then we grab this thing. I wish there was a way of testing these without having to cart this thing out. Okay, in goes the board. And we get some, we get some keyboard cable. And we plug that in. And then we get some power cable. And we plug that in. And then we switch it on and we hear the sound of the degauss. Boom. There we go. And then I press the power button. Yeah, still exactly the same. So what I expect to see with this now, we've got the power light coming on, we've got no chimes, we've got... Uh, this is not a 2SI. But having said that, the stream description says to see up. So, yeah. As you can see, it's it's powering up, but there's nothing coming out of the uh, the computer, so it's not actually starting up. But yes, okay, so this was my fill-in for anyone who's just joined. The reason why I'm now looking at a Cutter Classic is this was just a fill-in while I was uh, waiting for my UV solder mask to dry. Ugh. Ugh. And... I was doing a job which I knew, well, was pretty sure wouldn't fix it, but I wanted to do it as a process of elimination, which I have now done, and now I can move on. So, uh, excuse me, I'll be right back. I will go get my 2CI board, and then we will finish off the recapping. So, just give me about 20 seconds. <music> Okay, here we go. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Ooh. It's the power supply. No. Are you talking about that too? The problem with the uh, Color Classic? No, it's not the power supply. It's something on the board, unfortunately, um, uh, which I have to try and find. There's still quite a few things that it could be. It's just really hard testing those things, but anyhow. Okay, so. Uh, this is my 2CI board, and if we have a look uh, at my UV solder mask, um, I will just do this like this, uh, like this, and then like this, and then like this. You can see that that's all dried and looking nice. Uh, so that's all ready to have something on there. We're just protecting those. That goes nice and hard under the, the uh, UV light, and uh, the, the sunlight works faster than anything else. So the sunlight is really good for drying that stuff but it's not always sunny but today it is so joy um all right recapping guide recapamac.com.au there's a link in the description also links in the description for buying stuff um and um and then we have just got to go and stick, stick all these caps on so there are um four uh, axial um capacitors there are 10 surface mount electrolytic. It's not that bad as far as recapping goes. So we'll start off with the two little ones. We've got two 10 microfarad 16 volt. I will be replacing these with um, uh, tantalum capacitors instead of electrolytic. Um, tantalum capacitors are very, very reliable. People often mention the fact that these things when they die, they uh, can sometimes explode and stuff like that and, and do bad things. But the thing is that they are incredibly reliable. And especially when you look at the fact that in, on some of Apple's computers, they did actually make the computers with these, uh, uh, these tantalums. And those ones don't have any problems. So I think that's a fairly good advertisement for using these. Um, right, so I've got... The two 10 ones are off in this little region here. 
They're the uh, two smaller ones there. So we've got one there, and we've got one there. Zippity doo dah. Right. So now we're just back to this old process of putting capacitors on using my fancy painted method of sticking them on. It's not really, it's just the way I do it. <clears throat> Every now and again, I think it's fairly important for me to say that the methods that I use are not the right methods. They are just the methods that I use. I do get people sometimes uh, leaving comments in my chat saying things like, you should do this and you should do that. And my general response to that is, well, no, you should do that. If it works for you, then you go for it. If you want to, you know, create a YouTube channel and show your methods, then that's fine. These are the methods that I use. They're the ones that I have, I've, you know, I've tried different. Oh, God, I'm saying this and I'm absolutely stuffing this up. Um, I am, um, you know, these are the methods that I have. I've tried different methods. These are the ones that I've settled on as the ones that I like. And that's that. And I am not ever trying to say to someone this, there is a right and a wrong way. And I am doing it the right way. I simply, um, show people the methods that work for me. Let's see if we can get that actually in view. There we go. Okie dokie. There is a bird walking around on the roof of this shed. Uh, studio. <coughs> studio. That's a lot of solar. Okay. I do one side of each and then I flip the board around and I do the other side. Oh, come on, birds. Give us a break, will you? Probably pigeons. Pigeons. Actually, no, I can hear the calls. It's Indian miners. Indian miner birds. A little introduced pest. Oh, there goes my alcohol again. I must be getting drunk. My alcohol, by the way. Boop, 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 boop. I have just got so much solar on this one. I've got to fix that up. You can't go around saying to people, oh, yeah, your recapping job was okay, but you was a little bit too much solar, and then go in and do the same thing on mine. Can't be having that. Noise. Uh, we should look for when searching for tantalum surface mount caps to replace electrical lead, apart from correct values. Um, there are a few things you want to look out for. I mean, first of all, stick with a well-known brand. I use Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Uh, there are other ones I've used in the past. I used, uh, I think it was AVX as the brand. I've never had any problems with those. Um, so brand is one thing. Uh, another one is uh, lifespan. A lot of the time, these things, they are given a rating of how long they last for, the number of hours. The number of hours is based on how long they last run, running at their maximum temperature and stuff like that. So uh, that's certainly the case with electrolytics. I assume it's the same with tantalums. Size is a really important thing. Physical size, making sure they will fit in the spot. So make sure that you kind of measure the area and then make sure that the... Um, the cap you're replacing is going to actually fit in that space. Um, oh, geez, I'm running well on caps again. I have to order some more. Um, so yeah, and then obviously you know the uh, capacitance and the and the voltage. So there, that's what I would generally say. It, it's 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 it is quite daunting. I I know um, uh, you know when uh, you you jump onto a, a website like Mouser or DigiKey or something like that, and you type in the you say, okay, I'm looking for a capacitor with this and this, and then it comes up with like 1,200 choices, and you think, what? I've got to find some way of getting <laughs> that narrowed down. Um, but having said that, I do with a lot of my 
recapping guides on my website, and eventually with all of them, I do uh, have links to suitable replacements. Um, so for instance, with these Macs in particular, most of these Macs of this vintage use around about the same. There's four sizes you're going to need. You're going to need 47 microfarad 16 volt, 10 microfarad 16 volt, 100 microfarad 6.3 volt, or one microfarad 50 volt. And those four sizes will cover most of the vintage Macs. Um, so, yeah. Yes, sir. All right. I'm just this board is big. I've said it before. This board is big. It's cumbersome. It's very hard for me to hold this. Uh, get this here and make it visible and make it easy and all that sort of stuff. Looks very happy. The computer booted from the client's hard drive, and I was able to get most of the stickers off the top with just using my fingernails. Yay! It's nice when stuff works, isn't it? I'm telling you. I um. I've got a couple of problematic computers here at the moment, which I just sort of work on when I can. It's very difficult for me to just stay working on one computer for too long. And the reason for that is that I, I, don't, I don't really charge by the hour for a lot of that stuff. So I have to just try and fit in the problem ones in my spare time. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, when it's just like a straight recapping, in, out, bang, done, easy. I love it. But, uh, you know, when someone sends me one, I mean, I've got a couple at the moment where the, the customer knew that they were problematic. They knew it wasn't just a recap. They knew there were actually, there were other problems with them. Um, and so, you know, to some extent, it's like, well, okay, well, I can recap it, but I can't guarantee it's going to fix it. And then, uh, then when it doesn't, you know, you, I still feel, you know, I still want to try and get them working for them, um, if I can. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. Mm. I'm going to be adding a few sort of more videos, as I mentioned before, about uh, sort of soldering techniques. I have a particular way that I work that isn't necessarily the way that other people work. Um, but I will be doing sort of some videos on some of these um, sort of processes that I use. Again, I'm not, I'm never really trying to say to people this is the right way to do it. It's just the way that works for me. I have to stop saying that because as soon as I do that, um, the components move. When I say, this is the way that works for me, phew, work. Um, oh man, someone's cooking something outside and it smells good. I am so hungry. Let me get this finished so I can go eat. I'm going to eat them. How long have I been going for? Some time, I think. A couple of hours. What time did I start? 10.30 in my time. Yep, two hours. I don't have my fan on, do I? So I'm getting nice big flux fumes going on here. I better turn the fan on. As cold as I am, I do want to have some of this smoke blown away. I'm slightly cavalier when it comes to the safety in this stuff, which is not good, I realise. I'm not completely ignorant of it but I am a little bit lax sometimes so uh, uh, it is something that I do intend to rectify I've got plans for building a uh, building my own exhaust fan system in here I bought some parts for it and unfortunately what I had planned didn't really work so I have to go back to the drawing board and figure out um, how I am going to make it work but yeah, I do. Uh, I do want to have something a little bit, uh, a little bit better in here, and something that doesn't freeze me in the in the uh, in the winter time. Uh, don't mind having the fan blowing on me in the summer, but it's a little bit chilly this time of year. I mean, it's all relative. It's when I say chilly, it's I'm talking about Sydney chilly. So I'm gonna get that cold here.
There we go. Are we getting through these? Getting through them. Um, recapping and attempting the 640 by 480 mod soon for my color classic. Thanks for the detailed videos. You are most welcome. I hope it all goes well. I had to do, I had to do something funny the other day. I had to unmystic my mystic because I had to do some testing on a, a color classic board. And once you've done that mod, uh, it doesn't work properly with the color classic board anymore. So I had to kind of unmystic it for this testing, which is a real shame. Um, I'll change it back again, but you know, um, in the past, what I've done is I've had, if I've had to test a classic board, I've usually had a classic here, a customer's classic. So I just fire up the customer's classic and I just do the little test, but I don't have any, I've got boards here, but I don't have any actual computers, actual for full color classic computer here at the moment. Um, I do one of the other recapping jobs I'll be doing today, probably won't stream it, um, but one of the other recapping jobs I'll be doing today is another color classic because I get so many of them because they're very very popular and of course everyone loves doing the uh, mystic to it myself included it's a relatively non-destructive modification that you can do that allow you to stick an 040 logic board in it and if anyone has used the color classic before i tell you when you put in an 040 it flies i am having trouble getting this into an angle where i can work on it and then it's not going to fall off the table Just some more tweezers these are my big tweezers i can't use those Uh, Mr. Fahrenheit, good evening. <laughs> Someone please send Bruce a color classic for his testing. Uh, is there any advantage to using ceramic uh, SMT capacitors instead of tantalum capacitors? Well, ceramics are uh, non-polar. Um, so, uh, obviously, with, when you have a capacitor like this, it has a stripe on it showing a positive side. Same with an electrolytic. It is also um, a polarized capacitor that has a positive and a negative side. Ceramics are non-polar. They don't have a positive and a negative side. And I've basically always been told you should never replace polarized caps with non-polar caps. You uh, should only replace them with, um, you know, the, the same. So that would be a very good reason not to use a ceramic. If you're wanting to be in a situation where you perhaps wanted to do something a little bit adventurous and you're saying, no, I don't want to use tantalum, costs a little bit more, but one of the really good things you can do is use a polymer hybrid electrolytic capacitor. Um, they are they look essentially like a surface mount electrolytic capacitor, that little aluminium barrel with the black at the, on the bottom. Uh, oopsie! But they, instead of using a liquid electrolyte, they use a uh, powdered polymer, and so they don't leak, and they last a really long time. They're quite expensive though. So they are a good alternative because they do last a very long time and they're good quality and all that sort of stuff. But the downside is they are very expensive. Eventually, that's what we'll probably all be using for these. Um, I, I think tantalum caps have the potential to get more expensive in the future because tantalum is quite a rare mineral and, you know, we we'll probably run out of it eventually. And when we do, we'll be forced into using something else. And that's what I think we'll end up using in the... Uh, polymer capacitors I can show you I might have a board here that has some on it no there are other ones too uh, was it I can't remember there's another name um, I'm going to use ceramic capacitors on my PowerBook 100 LCD and it works oh, it'll work uh, I've seen I've seen plenty of people do it and it works I'm just I'm just saying it's not I wouldn't recommend it um, so these here I'm just going to zoom up here this is a really dirty board, by the way. It's got insect bits on it and everything. So these these ones are these are uh, polymer hybrid capacitors. So these ones won't leak, and you'll find these on a lot of your new uh, equipment and stuff like that. I mean, they can still fail. You know, they have a lifetime, like every all capacitors, but um, but they they're a lot better than your leaky surface mount electrolytic that has liquid in them. Right, and here's the last one. My last one is the one that I tidied up with my uh, UV solder mask. Get that on there. Um, okay. There we go. 
Now, I'm sure it's the same people watching, but I'll just mention this once again. The number at the top there, 476, that tells us what the rating of the capacitor is. It's 47 with six zeros after it, which is 47 million, and that gives us our uh, measurement in picofarads. If we then want to convert that into microfarads, we divide it by a million. So 47 million divided by a million is 47. So there we go. We know that's a 47 microfarad capacitor. Exciting, isn't it? too much solder there might just wick a little away wickety whack where's my wick where's my wick come on I have so many of these but I just they just are under the stuff I just need to clean up I just need to clean up in here much nicer okay so I think that's all of them of the uh, surface mount let's just have a quick little side view here and we'll whoops that's not a side view it's a blank screen uh, so here is the board. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's how many we should have, which is good. So um, or as usual, always do my checks. I'll just put my goggles on for that because I can't see properly. Uh, I need to make sure that the um, uh, the polarity is correct. So I've got to make sure my, all my positives are pointing in the right direction. So that's good, 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 good. Good, 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 good. Always doing double checks. It's always good. Um, and then I've got to check to make sure I've got the right caps in place. So we've got those little ones there, which is good. Should compare it, shouldn't I, with my little thingy? Do I be so bold as to just assume that I know all these things off by heart? Okay, okay. Good, good. Yep. 47, 47, 47, 47, 47, that's all good. And then the other thing I check is to make sure that I have actually got solder on the both sides of all of them, that I did actually do both sides and didn't accidentally forget to do one side. I've done that before. Mm -mm. Just like to be sure. To be sure, to be sure. Okay. Good. Okay, so that's good for all the um, surface mount capacitors replaced. Uh... Right. The cash card. I don't have a cash card. Sorry. This I don't have a cash card for this. I have never had a cash card for a bloody two CI. I'd love one, but they're expensive. Okay. There are, sorry, uh, Eric, just answering your question there about the mod. There are several different ways you can do the mod. Um, the, the version of the mod, which is the uh, safest for the power supply, keep in mind that the Color Classic power supply is already uh, pretty bad. It gets really hot. Um, the um, the version which is best for the power supply, which is referred to as the VGA mod, that mod will make it so that you can't put the original classic board back in. It will only work with the 575 board in there. There is another mod which is far more involved, and that way will allow you to uh, have the boards interchangeable. Uh, there is also a mod you can do to the LC575 board to make it so that it will work on the lower resolution and there's also a system enabler you can put in i think from memory that will allow the lc575 board to work in the color classic on the lower resolution so just worth mentioning all of these different things there are lots of different ways of getting a 575 board to work in a color classic shell but if you're going to do the vga mod your color classic will not work in that anymore so just letting you know that um okay I've lost, totally lost my thread now. That's right, axial caps. I've got a special container full of all my axial caps up here behind me. Here they all are. Well, it's not, this isn't all of them, but this is a few of them. Um, there, I've, there, I've got some others in another container. Um, and I am going to need one 220 microfarad 16 volt. Um, but anyone who's watched my streams before knows that I actually I upgrade them and put in a 25 volt instead of 16 volt. 
and then 347 for 70 16 volts and we're going to do the same with that 470 25 volts so we're replacing the 16 volt ones with 25 volt ones it's worth mentioning that you can go up in voltage but do not go down and uh, don't alter the capacitance rating. So capacitors have two ratings. They have the rating of their capacitance and they have the rating of their voltage. And you need to make sure that the capacitance is the same, but you can go up in voltage. Da -da -da. Okay, so there's my caps. I'm going to try and get them in. And when I do this, I, uh, I generally try and put them into the board with the all the information facing upwards because some evil people mount these on the board with the information facing downwards which makes it really hard to find replacements you know you've got to take the board the thing off before you can order your component and that just annoys me so me being the kind-hearted person that I am I like to make sure that I solder things in the way that I would like them to be soldered there you go uh, these are polarized, they've got the stripe pointing towards the negative, so the board has a little indicator of where the positive is, so I just need to make sure I get that. Like that. In you go. And then I'm just going to bend these pins on the other side, just so that the component doesn't fall out. Actually, I might just solder this in now. Okie dokie. How can you have the fan on during winter? I, I don't like it. I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Yeah, I'm not happy about it. It's cold. Um, it's cold. It is cold. Um, okay. Yes, resistance rating does also matter. That is also very important to mention. Uh, keeping in mind that what these particular capacitors do, their role on this board, the resistance isn't that important. Um, and the resistance can be affected if you go up by too many, um, uh, if you if you change the voltage by too much, so mm, 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 mm. Um, where's the other side? Oh, here it is, other way, upwards, upwards, downwards, downwards. Okay, that's our first. Um, uh, what do you call it? Axial capacitor soldered on. And let's hope I did it the right way. I wasn't really paying much attention as I was doing that. It's too busy gas bagging. Okay, that's good. Uh, let's put these other two on. What's the distance there? I like to try and bend these pins so that they come down nice and straight. So uh, let's uh, do a little inside view here. First time I've seen actual capacitors in 20 plus years. Yeah, they're not used very much anymore. That's for sure. You can still buy them. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the stream, it's probably not that important to, uh, to replace them on these. The original ones are probably fine, but people are sending these things to be recapped. I may as well stick new caps on. Uh, right. Let's try and get these as neat and consistent as possible, but it's very hard to do because I'm doing it by eye in terms of bending these things. Hey, there's my negative going that way. Oh, that's all right. And the negative going that way. I don't know who it is, but someone is torturing at me at the moment. I can smell, I can smell like pies. I can smell pastry baking. Yum. I'm hungry. Right, and more soldering. We're getting real close here, folks, so we'll be able to test this soon. Eric, thank you very much. Small thanks for doing uh, classic Mac videos. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I do enjoy providing these videos for other vintage Mac enthusiasts out there. Other people like me who have, you know, sort of, very tolerant partners. Um, I think I might have mentioned this on one of my streams just recently. I was uh, I had a whole mountain of computers uh, on the floor of my living room. Uh, 
you know, because a lot of people have been sending me recapping work lately. And so I just had this huge mound of computers in the room. And uh, uh, my wife was sort of saying, oh, you know, when, when are you going to be able to get these done so we can get our living room back? And I said, oh, shouldn't be long, shouldn't be long. I'll get those done. And then I just said, oh, by the way, that one, that one, that one, and that one, oh, and that one, they're actually all mine. And she just gave me this look. And I know the look was basically, and what are you going to do about moving those ones? Uh, I've had a couple of opportunities uh, recently to, whoops, to get some really good vintage Macs added to my collection. I've got a Quadra 950, which um, I've wanted for a long time, but of course they're gigantic. Um, I got a, uh, a um, what do you call it, mirror drive door G4. Um, what else? There's one other I can't remember. And, you know, these opportunities come along and I just don't like to pass them up because, I, you know, they're like a really good price. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'd really like that in my, in my collection. But I've just run out of space for storing things. Uh, I don't go too silly. I've got probably way more compact Macs than I should have. I'm probably going to sell... Um, I sell maybe a couple of those classic. I've got I've got a few classic. I might get rid of a classic or a classic two or something like that. But you know I've got a five twelve k e. I've got a plus an se an se thirty. A classic a classic two, and I've got a couple of classics and a couple of classic twos. I think from memory. Um, and then I've got like a beige G three. I really wanted that in my collection because you know it's the G three, but it's before they went all colourful. So it's a bit of a historic moment with that one. It's kind of the last of the beige. Um, I've got two VX, two CI, two SI, LC two, LC four seven five. It's another one. Oh, it's seventy six hundred, I think. Um, yeah, and there, I'm, I'm sure there's some more, but I can't remember. Um, Oh, to be a collector. And this is this hole that I had trouble getting the solar out. I, yeah, it's still, just got enough room to get the pin in. There we go. There we go. Look at that. North. <laughs> um... What is that system enabler? That's a very good question, but I think I can probably tell you uh, the Color Classic system enabler. Okay, uh, recap the... Sorry, I've got to catch up with this. Um, Axial lead forming tools do exist. Well, I don't have one, so... Uh, I recap the Quadra 610 using 47 micro 6 mil pound, but I tried 1.5 ohm caps instead of my usual 1 ohm, and the system turned on very slow, and SCSI wouldn't work. That's interesting to know. Um... Uh, system enabler. I can actually, one way you can find out about the system enablers is the, with the app Mac Tracker. Um, if you go to Mac Tra Tracker, you can download it for your phone or for your computer or whatever. And you go to Classic Macintosh and we go to LC575. 575. There we are. LC575. Uh, it should have. Or not? No, it doesn't. No, I don't know which one it is. You might have to look it up on Google, I'm afraid, as to what the enabler is. I did, someone just told me that, said, oh, yeah, that someone just, in a passing comment, oh, I just put the system enabler in at work, but they didn't say which one, so you might have to look it up, so sorry about that. So, MacTrack does sometimes show the system enabler for a particular system, but I don't, it, they did, it didn't for the 575 entry, so sorry about that. Um, okay, wife is tolerated, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that you do need tolerant partners when you're a collector or an enthusiast. Just imagine if John Scully contacted you to recap his, his classic. Yeah, I uh, I can't see uh, that happening, but uh, yes. Uh, let's go back to the microscope. This is the last capacitor, by the way, folks. So we're going to be firing it up after this. So it's pretty exciting, isn't it? It's the sort of excitement you feel when you're, you know, counting down from 10,000 to 1. You know, when, when you get to about, I don't know, 150, you start to feel that level of excitement. Okay. Right. 
go through the same checking process as when I am doing axial caps, make sure that I have soldered both sides. Well, that one's a bit unneat. Um, okay, negatives pointing in the right direction. Yes, yes, yes. Negative. This is why we check, folks. This is why we check. I just soldered that last one on backwards. <coughs> I'm not proud of myself. But as I mentioned, it's good to check. Okay, let's see if I can get all the solder out of this with my wick. Okay. How embarrassing put the cap on backwards. Oh my goodness. Alright, so let's see if I can get this out without damaging damaging anything. I hate taking out capacitors that I want to keep. <laughs> what a pain. So what I'm basically gonna do is I'm gonna try and apply some heat to the side of this pin and then just yank it out. This is that this is that one that was really difficult. Yep, got him out. Not too difficult. Uh, right. Oh, did it again. Okay. This would be so much easier if I had my key command, my quick keys working for this. Okay, so this time I'm going to put this capacitor on the right way, with the negative pointing to the negative. And the positive pointing to the positive. We will have far more success if we do this. Uh, I haven't left myself with enough hole to get this bloody pin through. I'm going to have to try and suck some solder out. Sorry. Sorry, folks. What a pain. What a pain. And this is all for my own stupidity. Did that give me enough? Did it give me any? Okay. No, oh, still not enough. Mirror drive door, best Mac for running OS 9. I agree. Um, the only other one that I would say that I like for running OS 9 is my G4 Titanium. I have one of those, by the way. I forgot to mention all the laptops I have. Got lots of laptops, um, uh, and obviously the G4 Titanium has the advantage of uh, being nice and portable. So uh, I uh, and that I can run OS9 on that because I've got quite a few games that run on OS9 that I like to dig out and have a play with every now and again, and so I do like to have my. Uh, my titanium to just whip out and do that it takes up a lot less space than the uh, the mirror drive door does, um, and the mirror drive door is loud. What did they call them? The wind tunnel. I'm going to need to use my magic tool, aren't I? I'm going to need to use my um machine. So I have a mechanical or motorized solar sucker here. I'm going to have to use that. Mirror drive door rules. Yes, I thought that might wait Jay out. Um, it's noisy, that machine, sorry. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to just fill it up with solder. And then I'm going to try and suck it out with the uh, machine, the um machine, the machine that goes, uh, uh, what do you use each Mac you have for? I find giving them something they are uh, with good reason to use. Yeah, uh, some of the Macs that I have, I just have because of their uh, where they slot into the Apple history, and so I just you know hang on to them for that reason. Um, the um, 
and then other ones I have for a very specific purpose. So, for example, there is the G. Someone will tell me which one it is. Uh, I'm sure Jay will remember. I I, I forget. Um, one of the laptops I have. I have. I think a Wall Street and a Lombard and uh, one other. I think laptop. Uh, a G3 laptop. But one of them has USB and SCSI, and I think it might be the only Apple device that has both, Pismo. Um, and that one is a really, really good bridging Mac for when you're working with old Macs and new Macs, because you can fire that up. Sorry about the microphone here. You can fire that up on the System 9. You can connect a SCSI external hard drive or a SCSI to SD or whatever. You can connect those to it format them, copy data and stuff. And then I can go to my modern Mac and I can stick stuff on a USB stick. So I go just copy a bunch of files on the USB stick, go across onto that the G3, I can then plug it in, copy it off, and then copy it onto a SCSI drive and do it that way. Now admittedly most of the time I, I transport files around, I actually do it via an FTP, an Ethernet. But you know, having that option of being able to transfer files from USB onto SCSI is really, really handy with the old Pismo. Oh the Pismo doesn't have SCSI. So which one is it? Which one? Which one? Which one? Um, so one of them, uh, it's the, maybe the Wall Street, does that sound right? Um, it has a, um, uh, it has both. It has SCSI and USB, which is really, really, really handy. Okay, uh, let me put my goggles on so I can see this properly. So, no USB on Wall Street though. Okay, so which one is it? Perfect. Sometimes it just pays to switch on the um machine. Should have done that right at the beginning. <clears throat> the magic of the um machine. Right, so let's get this capacitor on the right way around this time, shall we? Plus that way, minus that way. And this is going to be a bit tricky because they don't have pins to bend this time because I've cut them off. Uh, so I'm going to put some flux on the... Uh, on the thing, uh, next to the thing, just above the thing, just on the pin there, and I'm going to grab some solder onto my iron, and that flux is going to help this solder trans, uh, you know, uh, move across from my iron onto the pin. I'll do the same on this one. And there we go. Gonna have a quick look at these joins under the uh, under the microscope. So it might add a little bit more solder to one of these. Sorry, not getting the microscope view here, but I'll just have to change it straight back again, so you miss out. There we go. That looks good. Yep, that looks good. All right, so now this is why we check, because I stuffed that one up. So now we have the right capacitor on and planets are aligned and everyone is happy. So, now, will this work? Maybe, maybe not. It has been recapped, but it is still extremely dirty and it does have electrolyte on it. So there is always a possibility that it won't work until it has been cleaned. But I still think for the sake of everyone here who has stayed with me for this long, and uh, how many we got in here? I've got 28 at the moment. Wow, the numbers have gone up. Didn't expect that. I thought the numbers would get worse. Um, uh, so yeah, a couple of things about the, the 2CI, it has this processor direct slot. One of the great things about that was there were a bunch of accelerators available for this at the time. So you could upgrade this to a 68040 Mac if you wanted to with a, like a Daystar accelerator card to go in there. Then you've also got here, uh, is it that one? That's a ROM SIM. So yeah, no. Uh, and then we've got the new bus cards. And where's the, where does the, did the, ca the cache went into the PDS, didn't it? Yeah, there was a cash card you could get for these. You could put that on there. And the cash card really gave, gave a huge speed uh, of performance improvement. So much so that uh, it used to be an optional extra. But when the CI, because the CI was for sale for a long time, when the CI started sort of running out of steam, but they still had stock that they were trying to move, they started actually selling the CI with the cash card installed as standard. So anyhow, there we go. 28 viewers, 13 likes. <gasps> Nobody likes me. I'll live. I'll live. Uh, Power G3 bronze keyboard. Okay, no worries. Uh, the one before Pismo has got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All good.
Lombard. Is that is that the one? Is that the Lombard? Does that say Lombard rings a bell? Yeah. So although the Lombard is is perhaps not necessarily some people's favourite, there is a definite convenience in having those having both the USB and the uh, and the SCSI on there. I use my uh, GT. Hello, thank you for joining. You just arrived at the exciting time. I'm about to test this 2CI. Um, the um, um, these days I, I tend to use my classic a lot as uh, as you know the machine that I bring out when I want to transfer files around. I've got an Ethernet card in it. I can plug it into Ethernet. I can transfer stuff via FTP. Um, I tend to use my 2SI quite a lot because it's easy to whip open and get access to the SCSI. And for instance, if some because I sell SCSI to SDs. Uh, version 5 ones, uh, and I sell them so that they're already pre-configured and pre-formatted. So if someone wants a SCSI to SD and they say to me, I've actually got one at the moment where someone say, I want one for a uh, Color Classic. What I will do is I will get the SCSI to SD, I'll put an SD card in it, I'll format it using, you know, the right Mac tools and everything like that. I, you know, partition it, I'll install an operating system in it so that when that person gets that SCSI to SD, they can literally just plug it into the computer and go. And I do a lot of that setup on my 2SI because I can just lift the, the top straight off. Got it, it really easy access to the hard drive at the front. Just, you know, unplug it, plug in the SCSI to SD I'm working on, then run an external drive and just do the formatting and in system installation, do that. And I do that all on the 2SI. So that 2SI has a definite role with that. And 2SI is also quite portable, nice and easy to move around. Mm, excuse me. Uh, really need to clean that desk up. You sure? Are you sure about the GT? You don't think it just gives it character? We were actually saying at the beginning of the stream, we were just seeing how long will it be. I mean, I'm just testing the limits of how long I can go without cleaning it. Um, so, uh, right, okay, okay. So, time for testing. So, let's go and get this. Um, I'm just wondering if I just test it without putting it in the case. Might just be easier to put it in the case because the power supply sits on there rather precariously when you uh, don't have it in the case. So, here's the case, and I'm uh, facing that way, put all the bits and stuff out that way. I better put some RAM into this too. Come on, get in the holes. There we go, in the holes. Slide that back, get some RAM, get a speaker. I won't bother about putting in the uh, uh, the reset buttons or anything like that. I can live without them for now because this is all going to go into the old Sonic Cleaner. So it's all coming apart again. So uh, there's our cute little fan which goes, goes, I mean, not fan speaker. Doesn't look like a fan, does it? Um, it goes here. And just this helps actually keep the board in place. Um, and we'll plug that in so that we have some sound because we love to hear a chime when we're testing things. One of the things we love about Max it was one of the things we were discussing on the Mac Yak show. I think uh, just yesterday we were just talking about how important the chime is on a Mac and how silly it was that they took them away and they have now brought them back or they brought them back as a configurable option. Um, Love a chime. So, what are people's what what's people's favourite chime when they're uh, when they're switching on a computer? What's the chime they like to hear the most? Which computer for them, you know, sort of generates the most emotion when they hear the chime? I'm just curious to see what people's thoughts are on that one. Oi. So I'm just putting RAM at the moment. I'm sorry, this is very boring. Uh, is it a screwless case like the LCs? It's mainly screwless. There is one screw that you use to hold the drive assembly on, uh, which also stops the board from moving backwards and forwards. But in theory, you can you can use this without the screw. That without that one screw. MDD try and wakes up the dead. That is a loud computer. That is one loud computer. I, I couldn't agree with that more. Another one that's loud is the 950. 
having just got myself a 950 recently, I love the sound of the quadra chime. You know, that it, I, for me, I just I do love that sound. Um, but uh, yeah, whoa, that is a loud speaker. Okay, that took me a really long time and I apologize. Uh, these bits can all stay out for now. Uh, we do want a power supply, which is just down here. This may end up needing recapping as well, but we'll try it out first. I'm not going to bother putting in the drive assembly because I'm certainly not going to boot from a floppy. And there's no hard drive in it, so what is the point? I have my SCSI 2SD that I had before floating around, uh, which I'm going to use. That's this guy here, SCSI 2SD version 5.5. Uh, I think this has system 7.1 on it. I mean, it's got 7.1, 7.5, 608, and 7. 7.0. So, yeah, it's got 6, 608, 7.0, 7.1, and 7.5. But I'm pretty sure it's set as uh, to, you know, to start from 7.1 at the moment. So that goes in at the back. This is my little adaptery thingy so that I can have my display. And then I'm going to use my little tiny weeny little screen, which I have used many times before, and it will do for testing. Ugh. I am freezing and hungry. I don't know what anyone's going to do with that knowledge, but I'm just letting you know. So this will be the last thing I do in this live stream. Um, there we go. It's not sitting in there very well, but hopefully it'll stay in. And plug in my little screen. Very handy screen, this one. I did not buy it for this purpose. This is a uh, it's designed for um, attaching to my, um, uh, what do you call that thing, my video camera, uh, to monitor what I'm filming. Um, but it's just coming as a really handy little portable video monitor. Okay, so... Yeah, I can probably turn off the fan now. Thank you, Trina. It's nice to have the voice of reason around sometimes. <clears throat> All right. Uh, right, so I'm going to plug this in. Now, I didn't put the power button on, so it's a little bit difficult to get my finger in there. So I'll just connect up a keyboard so that I can start it up from the keyboard. Oh, come on. I've rolled over the end of the cable. There we go. <clears throat> okay, exciting times, exciting times. So there are still um, a lot of things that could potentially be wrong with this. As I mentioned before, uh, it hasn't been cleaned. Uh, the power supply could be shot. Um, many things. I may have made a mistake during the recapping. That's always possible. Uh, so just setting expectations, you know, just how it is. So we ready? Three, two, one. Hey, I don't know if you were able to hear that, but that was a chime. Uh, oh, and I can see it's definitely sending out a video signal. It's still black at the moment, doing a memory test. Hey, look at that. And we've got a little cursor up there. You can't see that at all because it's so uh, bright. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up here and I'm going to knock things over. And I am going to do this. Well, okay, there we go, and then I can just, how's that look? Is that viewable? Now, one of the things I do know about this particular computer is even with the uh, external connected, uh, if you don't have a hard drive connected to the internal, it will, uh, it has termination issues, so it won't boot. So what I basically need to do is I need to connect the hard drive. It doesn't even need to be switched on. It just needs to be plugged into the cable. So I need to just quickly find one, which I have one just over here. And I might even have a SCSI cable. Oh, I do. Oh, look at how... This is this is a this is one that's been very badly stored, unfortunately. But let's just switch this off quickly. 
I'll just unplug it. That'll be the easiest thing. Okay, here's unplugged. I will then plug in this SCSI hard drive. And with a little bit of luck, that will give us the necessary termination we need uh, in order to... Hello, Peter. How are you? Um, right, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, set the low expectations so that people don't get disappointed. That's 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 my uh, my mantra. Okay, so I've got a hard drive connected. You can't see it very well because it's so dark, but I have a hard drive connected now, uh, and that should give us the necessary termination. God, this look how dirty this cable is. This needs to clean. Um, I that should give me the necessary termination that will allow it to boot from my external SCSI to SD. So we'll switch it on again. <coughs> Where's my keyboard? My mouse, sorry. Here's my mouse. Hey, hey, what did I say? You're making a liar out of me. I was faffing around with the SCSI to SD the other day. You know what? I may have ended up doing something to make it not work. That's always possible. Very disappointing. Is this not terminated? It's possible that this hard drive isn't terminated. No, it should be. Oops. That's around the wrong way. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. going to try something here. I have no, this cable may not even work. It's so old. It's probably shot. Uh, but we'll just try this anyway. I really shouldn't be plugging and unplugging SCSI while the power's on. Hey! Welcome to Macintosh. <clears throat> okay, we're looking at system 7.5. So I obviously left this set up with system 7.5, not 7.1. So <laughs> it'll work, but system 7.5 is a little bit slow on an old 2CI. I can tell you that from experience. Uh, we're loading up in monochrome. That's because there's no battery on this thing. And so when it loads up the first time, you know, without PRAM, it's going to just revert to black and white. But as soon as it started up, I should be able to change it into color. Even though it has a blue tinge at the moment, that's just because of the camera. It's actually completely and totally gray from where I'm sitting. Um, every cap, multiple transistors and diodes, a couple of resistors and inductors and still won't power on. Any suggestions? Well, it sounds to me like you replaced just about everything. So maybe just the ones you haven't replaced. Uh, you, it sounds to me like you have done all of the things that I would suggest. I mean, generally, uh, I mean, first of all, obviously, when it comes to the chirp, I assume you've gone on and had a look at... Um, uh, you know, sort of the uh, what are the, those books? You know, Macintosh Repair and Upgrade Secrets and stuff like that, and and the Dead Mac Scrolls. Have have a look at those. They're available as PDFs on the interwebs. If you do a bit of a search, um, see what they suggest. I, I'm assuming you've done that with the old Mac Plus. I've generally found most of the problems are associated with um, a lot of the uh, either the sort of diodes on the bridge rectifier, which you've probably done, or the um, uh, the resistors right down the bottom of the analog board, they have a fairly high failure rate on those as well because they don't cope well with the heat. And of course, Mac Pluses uh, don't have a fan in them. So, uh, all right, let's just have a look and see what we've got here for monitor choices. I've got 640 by 480. I've got 256 colors option. Yeah, look at that. Um, Okay, and I'm just going to open up, uh, how about, this will just be the last thing I do before I, uh, before I finish up. I'm going to see if, have I got any games on here? These are all my utilities. Uh, oh well, it's so hard for me to read. Yeah, I think I've got all my games on this drive here, disk 3. Uh, multi-boot system. 
and games. It's really an interesting thing. I got hold of a computer once, a second-hand computer from somewhere. I can't even remember where it came from, but I got it from someone, and uh, here we go, Warlords, why not? And I, uh, um, well, I fired it up, and the hard drive was absolutely full of, like, 1980s, I guess, probably early 90s, sort of early internet days, I suppose, so that'd be 90s, uh, full of uh, lots of low-res uh, pornographic pictures. Um, it's quite funny. Okay, I need to rebuild the desktop because all of my, uh, uh, whoops, oh, keyboard. Steady on there. Okay. Let's just have a little bit of nostalgic fun here with Warlords opening. Oh, what happened? Oh, I'm pressing a key down. I'm pressing a key down. I wanted the tune. I want the tune. Has anyone else here ever played Warlords before? It was one that I used to play a lot um, when I was younger. Um, I want the tune. Let's try that again, shall we? And then I'll uh, wrap it up. Okay. Okay, that's enough. Bored now. Ah, oh, yes, I used to spend many an hour playing the old Warlords. Good fun game. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And I just want to very quickly check and see how much, yeah, memory there is there. Not much, clearly. Oh, that's the wrong mouse. That's the mouse for controlling my, my new Mac. Okay. <laughs> that's how much it loves System 7.6. Okay. All right. Well, it's crashed. Um, with an, uh, it just, it's always nice to be reminded of just how flaky those old operating systems were. And how often they crash. Uh, that's the uh, that's the fun. Um, all right, folks. Well, I think what I will do now is I will uh, bid the all farewell. I will say a big thank you to everyone who joined. Anyone who came in late and didn't get to see um, all the exciting recapping moments, you can uh, um, you can sort of uh, uh, go back and catch up on all that. You know, because it's just a thrill a minute the whole way through. Um, I will just very quickly catch up on the chat here. Uh, 2FX where it needs just an active Terminator plugin. Yes, that's exactly right, Peter. That's uh, completely and totally correct what you were saying there. Um, uh, JJ Brubaker, hello. Um, da -da -da. And Larry Penny gives a cigarette burn from a blown uh, Scott. Yeah, okay, yeah, no worries about that. Yeah, so look, sorry, Nate. It's it really does sound like you have done everything that I would suggest. So I uh, I don't really have anything further to to add. I'm afraid. So my apologies for that. Um. Okay. Good. 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 No notification again. Yes. Well, that is YouTube for you. Uh, I am working on that. What I'm actually planning to do for people who are interested, I'm planning on my website to have a little um, uh, form registration type thing, uh, just an email, just putting in your email address, nothing else. It won't be used for anything else. The data won't be shared with anyone or anything like that. And when I do a live stream, I will send out a, a, an email notification to say I'm live streaming in the next 30 minutes or something like that. So... Um, Obviously, with email, it's very difficult for me to make it sort of instantaneous. But um, for people who are interested, I will be setting that up. I will let people know when, um, you know, sort of when I've got that set up. But I am planning to do that because I've had a lot of people contacting me and saying, how do I know when you're going to stream? Now, unfortunately, because of the, because of the way my life is, I don't really have an option to, um, um, uh, to kind of schedule uh, streaming at a particular day or time. I try and do it on Saturday or Sunday morning, my time. 
um, but I'm not always able to do it. I'm not always able to do it every time and sometimes it's a little bit different. So I, it's very difficult for me to schedule the streams. So I am reliant on notifications of some description and the YouTube ones just haven't been working out particularly well. Of course, make sure you have the bell, the little bell thingy selected. Um, but other than that, there's not really much more I can suggest. So as I say, I will be, um, I will be doing a, uh, a my own notification system and when that's up and running, I will let you know for, for the, uh, the ones that are keen that would like an email when I'm about to stream. So everyone, I will say thank you to you all for watching. I do appreciate everyone who hung around all the way to the end for the, uh, the testing and everything like that. So uh, do please enjoy uh, the rest of your day, morning, evening, whatever it happens to be. I am going to go and eat some food. See you next time.